Yeah, I was going to say very soon it's going to be night anyways. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is the Open Global Mind check-in call for Thursday, October 1st, 2020. Welcome to October. How did the year go by so fast? Mm. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, so I was, I, I think I'll finish my check-in. Just I, I gave a speech on Monday. The, the tech before actually giving, doing the live Q&A was funky. It was just like in the scene from broadcast news where Holly Hunter dives across the studio to jam a, a tape into a VCR, into a tape player for, you know, to get something on the news. Uh, but it was fun and the talk is up. I just put the link uh, and the Medium link does work. Thank you, Pete. Um, and I'm gonna post it on LinkedIn, post it in a, in a bunch of other places. Uh, so we may ship this call an hour later. Um, see how that works. I kind of like that by the time 8.30 is done sort of uh, in my day, I've, we've, done a, we've done a call and, and they, they've got me excited and we're sort of uh, you know, running on stuff. So I do like that about them. So let's play with that. Uh, and then on Facebook, I had a, a thread a week and a half, two weeks ago about what do you call it when someone is accusing you of doing the actual thing that they're doing? And it was really interesting. It was very fruitful. A lot of people jumped in and contributed. Uh, gaslighting is a, is a good term for this. Uh, the big lie from Joseph Goebbels is good for this. Darvo is good for this, but nobody knows what Darvo means. So you can't just throw Darvo in conversation because it's too obscure. Um, and I just, in the shower this morning, I thought of a term that I'm, I'm gonna go back to that thread and sort of float it, but I wanted to float it here, which is flame throwing. Because Gaslighting is starting to get known and it feels, to, so I, gaslighting is not offensive enough. Um, so, so what I mean is the very intentional strategy of doing something incredibly ballsy and illegal and outrageous yourself. So you were gonna accuse the other side of doing it. So uh, the, the, the thread, I was in a conversation yesterday where it was made pretty clear to me that on the far right, there is a, there's, a, there's a trope, a meme, that the 2016 election was not a peaceful transfer of power. It was a coup. Therefore, a coup is justified now and at the 2020 election. And sorry to raise everybody's blood pressure right now. And, and I sort of wandered, and I'm like, damn, that is, that is a trope. And Trump struck that note during the debate. There was no peaceful transfer of power. That if you look, there's a clip where he says exactly that. So that this is a live thing. And to me, that's flamethrowing. So I just want to say, uh, later we can talk about it if you want, but just uh, flamethrowing seems to me to be a, a, an interesting moniker for an offensive rhetorical strategy that is in full time use right now. And I, I need to figure out how to douse the flamethrowers, how to, how to poke a hole in the tank or something. Uh, that, that would be in, in, incendiary. Incendiary, so, exactly, yeah. exactly. And projection was the other word that came up in the, in the Facebook chat, uh, you know, the psychological forms of projection which work, but they're also for me a little, a little too passive. So um, incendiary is good, at the end, and I think that's sort of naturally where I got from flame throwing. Uh, yeah, flame rice throwing. tagging as a, as a verb. What is it? Rice tagging. Rice, ta rice tagging, okay, okay. Has it got that yeah. tagging in it for memes for, you know, so. Well, there's also the false, false flag is, is, a, is a known thing. So yep. this is different from false flag operation two, right? Um, anyway, so uh, enough for me to check in. Let me go through um, our, our, our humans on the, on the call. How about let's start with uh, Scott, Kevin, Luke. Hello, everyone. Um, my video is not working today, but that's all right. Um, so in my feeling outmatched by the, the big brains in this group, I still try to contribute every week as much as I can. But I understand humbly the depth that all of you go to. And, and that's, it's really just an honor to be here. So the thought that came to mind this week was I was thinking about how we uh, talk about ourselves, because that seems to be something that we've been interested in trying to corral a little bit. And the idea of a tree came up, which, you know, is, is simple. But what happened was it came up because I was looking at the relationship between truth and trust. And what I found was that truth, trust, and tree all came from the root word deru, D-E-R-U, 
or, uh, which is uh, Old English. And it was just fascinating as I went down this path because trust um, has this also, the thing that you preserve for someone else for the future. That's, you know, another one of the meanings of trust. A trust is something that you are, you are, you are given the, the responsibility of holding on to for someone in the future, which also seemed kind of what we're working on here. Um, but it was just a fascinating little, little journey into the, uh, you know, the etymology of truth, trust, and tree and how it all came together and how the roots, as Jerry, you were talking about, um, combining the old with the new. So we have the roots expressing themselves in the new leaves. And it, it just, I don't know, it made a lot of sense. And, and even went into the Greek side where that, that deru uh, was the root of, of dendrite, which, you know, of course, uh, we've, we've talked about that dendritic portion of what we do. So- Where's Judy, where's Judy? Yeah. yeah, I thought I was looking for Judy, but I don't see her. But thank you. That's a that's a good <coughs> observation. Um, so. Somebody's coughing somewhere. Um, thank you so much. So I I hadn't realized that that Luke was actually Romer. So sorry about that, Romer. I uh, uh, you renamed yourself, and I'm like, oh, it's not a strange. It's not a new. It's not a newbie. It's it's actually Romer. Um, so let's go, Kevin, then Romer, then Hamilton. Thanks. <clears throat> I've mentioned that we're working with a cohort of. Uh, uh, interconnected economy, neighborhood economy folks. And uh, we discovered in talking to Nori, which is a carbon market yesterday, that having a distributed network of farms works to sell your carbon as long as you have a data manager in the middle who has everybody's trust. And we have a data manager in the middle who has everybody's trust on the, the church farms. And we also do with the indigenous. There's a Miwok woman. So, uh, we're going to go forward with that. We, we discovered that it's doable uh, with some small farms and big farms, and then we can uh, figure out what we do from there. And if we get it and we sell it, and then there's also affiliate sales where, you know, people who care about you pay more. So anyway, progress on that. So it's, it was pretty interesting. To, this big idea actually works. So that's kind of cool. That's fabulous. And I, and I love how positions of trust matter so much in social systems, of course. Uh, Klaus, did you want to comment? Yeah. Yeah, Kevin, I would love to because Kevin and I had an exchange and uh, yeah. we, so far the uh, systems that I'm aware of are starting at 2,500 acres uh, 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 collected farm. So if you have figured something out, I would love to know it. Yeah, we have small and big farms that, that as a collective are, are okay enough is apparently what they're saying. So uh, we'll, we'll see if, if when we really do the met, we'll see. I'll, be, I'll, I'll keep you in the loop. Thanks. Love that. Thank you. Um, let's go uh, Romer, Hamilton, Stacy. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's been, uh, I've been missing all this discussion for the past uh, few weeks and uh, hope that all of you from the West Coast are uh, doing well. So uh, it's been a, uh, a little bit of a stressful week here. And uh, well, uh, my wife's uh, last day for work was yesterday. So uh, we've been, uh, you know, uh, working on, uh, you know, some issues here and cranking up something here. So, so uh, my apology for uh, missing some of the discussions. Uh, however, thanks to Charles, I've seen the uh, video of uh, Tom Atley. And I'm trying to make sense in terms of uh, the framework that was presented there, which is the uh, harvesting of ideas, cultivation of ideas, and then digesting it. And then finally, from the framework, he's got this uh, other side of it where there is some purpose on this in terms of serving certain uh, uh, stakeholders. So I, I kind of brought this up as a question to the group in terms of uh, who are we really serving in OGM and who are the stakeholders that we are working with. And I'm trying to relate this with uh, what uh, Tom Atley was uh, discussing because I can see some uh, very nice, uh, 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 I would say, relations there. 
So um, I, I would be really grateful to uh, understand more about the group and uh, more clarity would be uh, appreciated so uh, I can figure out where I can help and uh, figure out where I could fit in. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Romer. And I'll, I'll hold off trying to answer that until we've done the check-in round, but that's a, that's a really super orienting question for OGM. Uh, Hamilton, Stacy, Neal. Uh, hey guys, I'm like Romer, I miss all you. It's been uh, a pretty hectic couple, at least a couple hectic Thursday mornings, I guess, um, which is conflicted and also some uh, weeks as well, but um, great stuff going on. I uh, The video that we're doing for Swift and InnoTribe goes live Tuesday. Uh, so if you've registered, if you're a registered attendee of Cybos this year, which is free and you may do, then you could watch the uh, the, the Swift Pirate TV video that we did with Ann Pendleton and Peter and Amber Case. Uh, Clamber, the artist, not Case Organic, the tech star uh, is what is the hat she's wearing. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, and then I just said, there's two things that have been, I found one, Amber turned me on to this uh, web, uh, group called the, the Guild of Future Architects, um, which is very, very OGM. You probably all know about it. I was the last one to the party, but it's not young people who will grow up to be architects. It's people who are architecting the future. Uh, and it has a guild. And of course, we sort of love that word here. Um, and then the other thing that I'm reading that I would recommend, um, I don't know if you guys know Scott Smith. Um, common name, Scott Smith, he, uh, Changist is his organization. This book is called How to Future, Leading and Sense Making uh, in an Age of Hyper Change. So uh, it's a real practical book around how do you stop making innovation and futurists so theoretical and get really practical and tactical about it. And it's, I don't know, I'm early and it's a good read. So I would recommend that. Hope you all are well. Yeah. Thanks, Hamilton. That's uh, uh, I've got GoFa in my brain under OGM neighbor communities, which um, I've connected a whole bunch of organizations to. And it's, it's sort of uh, a next steps item for me to approach those communities and say, hey, how do we serve you? How do we connect? Uh, how do we bridge? So that, very cool. Awesome. Yay. Um, thank you. And are they going to post the video to the Pirate TV session openly on the web after CBOS? Yes. OK, cool. So uh, I'll make sure that link gets out. That sounds great. Um, Hamilton, so uh, Stacy Neal J. Did Scott leave? I don't see um, him. Scott anymore. was having trouble with his video. He may have dropped off. Um, okay, well. You were you're right. Okay. I had, um, I had a conversation with Scott, so I want to echo what he said about humility, and I'm really grateful to be in this room. Um, I'm going, so I'm working on a, a participatory action research project, which I'm calling PARP. And um, Basically, what I'm doing is creating an organizational toolkit, and it goes in two paths. And if what so basically what I do is intelligent designs, personally designing people's futures. So I'm, I'm like the opposite to like a Walt Disney. And I'm coming with a beginner's mind. And I'm a learner, like somebody that would use Jerry's brain. So from a systems point of view, my brain reflects your brain. And so the process I developed for myself is to only use Facebook Messenger and Facebook, because that to me was my world. And coincidentally, or there are no accidents, the first thing I ever wrote was something called Through the Eyes of Facebook, what I learned about the world around, something like what I learned about myself and the world around me. Anyway, cool. to that to that point, my adaptation requires that I do certain things and I'm testing this out. So right now, you could imagine that you're all a DAO because the other part is a test game for whether DAOs will actually work. So it goes to governance as well. So I'm gonna ask Charles because he has a piece of my text because I sent something to Lauren and to him as part of my experiment. So I will ask him to share that with the group. And I will also make a request of the whole group, again, part of my experiment. The one thing that I would really need for some support, in the old practical knowledge ecology, I set up a Facebook. 
that I put my stuff there because nobody wanted to have a Facebook presence, but I knew I needed it. And they very kindly agreed to allow me to do it. Unfortunately, only Lauren has privileges. And so I can't get a character that I wrote out of the repository. So your first task, should you choose, and you're working as a group now, because this is learning. So we're starting at the mastery level. We're going from the top and we're going down. We're flipping the paradigm. So you have the beginner's mind practicing mastery and teaching is what I do best because on the other level, I'm a great learner and I found my way through Jerry's mind. So you are actually the template that my brain grows. And you might be interested to know that right now I have some masters, Barry Court, Michael Josefowitz, and a new player that you haven't met yet, and they are working in a Facebook Messenger thread. And I'll be asking some people to observe as judges right now just by looking at what I know, because I what I recognized is that I use Tammy Lee Myers alphabet code the way other people use tarot cards. So I'll be channeling the wisdom of Mother Earth. And I'm working with Julia Hayden, who's Princess Gaia. And it blends, you know. Oh, and Charles, if you could do me another favor, if you could send them the testimonials that you guys made for me. I know it was a rough cut in practical knowledge ecology. If you can't, I have it. So I could, I could do that myself. But if I would like to offer an invitation and then I'm out of here. I'm just going to watch. Here's my invitation to the group. First of all, I would like to offer Scott Mooring, Roma, Roma, I, Roma, and Hamilton Ray to come on down and join the master class competition. And I would like to invite Doug Carmichael and Jerry Mulkowski to come and observe as guest judges to be, because so again, it works like the brain. And there will be um, an art, like there's, a, there's different wings. And if you come, I'll tell you more. There will be a barn raising call in GCC with Sam Hahn because it's his collaborology that I'm, you know, Doug Engelbart's on the bottom level and then Sam and now me over there. So the brain, Jerry, I would really like you to be there. Doug, I really don't know much about you yet, but I will find out. But I can tell from my intuition that I would love for you to at least share some information with me back and forth. With that, I'm complete. Thank you for indulging me. This is my process. <laughs> oh, I have one more person. Pete, can you come too? Pete Kaminsky? Or well, everybody's invited to observe. Everybody's invited. It's a competition and that's how we play and party. Oh, by the way, my Hebrew name is Joy. Just want to point that out. <laughs> so come play with us. Oh, and Judith, if you see Judith, I would like her to be there. I need her to be there because we're, this is an educational program. Okay, bye. That's awesome. Um, Stacy. I'm, I'm blown away. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely invitation. Uh, like I'm in, count me in. And awesome. you've, got, you've got a great crew of people you're inviting in to do this. Um, I haven't talked with Barry Court in forever. Uh, I'm going to put you in the thread to observe. I told them I will, so I'll make that announcement. But I just, you know what? It's because of the this work is really taxing on the body. So this is also a health kind of yeah. thing. So I'm trying to, like right now, my mouth is really dry. I want to teach self. So it's just, just a little bit of time so I could give everybody the proper attention and do it right. But we're going to do it together and I make mistakes, but that's how um, there will be a lot of mistakes on purpose. And there'll be gambling and money and economics and all good stuff. Thank you. <laughs> and this feels like a very integrative um, project. It feels like you're pulling from all different kinds of places uh, that are super interesting. And I'm telling the stories of the generations before me. So just so you know, as a clue, I'm working above Oprah. Oprah is my mentor. Okay. Bye. Cool. Thank you. I'm listening now. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. Thank um, you. Okay. So the ante has just been raised enormously for checking in, but with that, I'll go to Neil, Jay, and Ken. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Neil here from Leuven in Belgium. Um, 
been a few weeks since I saw you, so forgive me. I've had a few drinks in that time. I'm feeling better for it. No, um, we've had some wonderful rain in the last uh, week and we'd had very, very, very dry uh, summer. And so the last showers we had prior to these ones had soaked less than a centimetre into the ground. We had one uh, rainstorm the other night that soaked 10 inches into the ground. And so we're, you know, the garden is just looking fantastic. The cooler weather is here. Uh, the pressure is off to keep walking around with watering cans and keep uh, keep things alive and the, the winter crop is in and should hopefully with the continued rain do very well. Um, in terms of uh, what I've been up to, been involved in a couple of conferences since I saw you last. I was uh, a speaker on social media competence and communication in times of crisis with the Formvelt and Lean Base conference based out of um, Gita Payne's world in uh, uh, in Germany. Um, Stephen Wallace, the systems thinker, uh, one of the main presenters in that online conference that went for several days. Um, been involved in the R3.0, which is started off as accounting standards and then has moved through an eight-year evolution and is now literally looking for new ways of accounting value beyond GDP, beyond um, typical monetary measures, and is really shifting the, the nature of the game uh, with UN uh, support. Uh, still difficult to get funding because in all these cases where the more conscious are too far ahead of the current paradigm, uh, very hard to be supported. Um, but literally shifting the, the way in which we will be accounting during collapse. Uh, we're in a social ecological collapse right now. And the question is, how do we keep doing what we're doing um, when we know it's not going to work? So. That uh, then leads into some major projects that I'm involved in. One, commercial and confidence, so I can't tell you the details, but potentially able to influence the culture of Europe at some point in the future. And part of my role there was to help shift the, uh, the level of thinking from coordinating at level to if this, then why not coordinate here? And the, the team I was talking with prior to the meeting with the consortium team were reticent to, to go that far because, oh, we didn't challenge the system. And I took it on myself to stretch that envelope and see what was possible. And the team that we were speaking to were going, yes, this is the sort of thinking. So I hope that, again, this is an interesting role as an unpaid volunteer trying to enter as a potential partner for a European project that could change the culture of Europe, potentially have already changed the scope of, which, of, of how we cooperate and collaborate. Uh, and the level at which we do that. And this is a critical element because it links back a bit to what Stacey was saying about knowledge ecologies. And so Jerry has seen some of the connections I've been trying to make between uh, Jerry, Michelle Bounds, um, George Poor around knowledge ecologies. And the challenge I see is that large knowledge commons like uh, online global mind, like peer to peer wiki, uh, sitting there underutilized having difficulty connecting with on the ground projects. Um, I'm not being critical of anybody here, but what are the multiple alternative vehicles for different jurisdictions? How do we manage the commons in ways that maintains the commons, not just gives benefit to those that extract from the commons. So I've been playing with some diagrams, not as the expert, but to try and challenge the thinking around what does the model look like and what are the stocks and flows? And how do we put some rules onto those stocks and flows around contribution and distribution? Because these are critical elements of how we value, what we value and where we're going. And I'm finding the best way to do that is to attract people to a higher point of convergence rather than trying to converge at level. What if we were all aiming to change the culture of Europe to fit within the collapsing social ecology, right? And if that, how do we stay parallel or not absolutely on the same page yet longer so that we can f feel the emerging patterns as we go through a longer process? And in a conversation today with a professor of cultural heritage uh, in Leuven, um, the connection there around how do we not just look at the cultural uh, heritage of 600 years of university involvement in creating towns and cities in Europe, what about the cultural heritage we're creating now that will be here in 500 years if we get it right? And so it's that, how do we get the knowledge ecology to direct the creative economy, the narrative, the storylines, the processes, the knowledge pools 
in ways that give us better designs for a future which isn't going to be the same as the past. So that's my check-in for today. Thank you. Long time no see. Great to be back and um, looking forward to interacting with you all further. Thank you so much, Neil. <clears throat> We're all involved in such lightweight, frivolous endeavors. I think it's amazing. Um, Ken only has a half hour. He can be with us this morning. So I just realized I should flip the order so that Ken goes first. So Ken J. Pete. And you're muted, which is something I wish I could have screamed out to Donald Trump <laughs> during the debate. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Nice to be back. I've missed you the last couple of weeks. I've spent the last three weeks in hotel rooms. I'm really cranky. I do not do well being inside a hotel room all day long. Um, I've got uh, an iPad, my computer, and two phones that I'm constantly checking, um, and I am completely outraged by the work, the way that things are not working there is. I talked to my boss the other day and I said, between you and me off the record, do you think there's something sinister going on? She said, absolutely. There has been uh, a level of sabotage that I can't put my finger on, I can't point to. Um, anything specific, you know, I have no evidence, but it just feels wrong. There's been so many breakdowns, so many things. This week we were told to do something and a brand new manager came in and, and you know, told everybody, you have to get your team out there and you've got to get them to work. And, you know, if they're not working, give me their names. I'm going to call them. And people pushed back and said, who the hell are you? They don't know you. The, these people were told they did not need to work more than five hours a week they're not going to listen to you. You don't have any relationship with them. And we're offended by the way you're coming in here. So by the way, this is for the U.S. Census. Um, it, it has been eye-opening to see the way that, um, in, especially in light of the, the federal case that's gone on in uh, Judge Coe's court in San Jose, um, this is very, very fucked up. And it's really made me angry at a deep, deep level. And it's made me disgusted. And it makes me very gravely concerned and worried because I think that um, this is trickling down through every level of civil service across the, the entire government. When pressed the other day, the manager, people were saying, why the pressure to get done by Wednesday when the judge has given us an extra month? And finally, she came out and said, because that's what Washington wants. So um, there's, this is coming from the very top. Um, and it is really, really disheartening. So uh, I'm usually a lot more um, upbeat, but three weeks of, of 15, 16 hour days um, stuck in a hotel room inside four walls where I, I get out once in the morning for coffee and that's it, has really taken a toll on me. So I'm really delighted to be here. And now my, my phones are lighting up and I have to go in a second, but um, thank you to, to just for being here. It's, it's good to know you folks are still out there in the world. I felt very disconnected. Ken, hang in there, buddy. Hang in there. We need you out, we need you out there. Thank you. Thank you. And I think also, we're wrapping up, but yeah. Thanks for describing your situation because it's, it's, it's easier for us to hold you in our hearts during this time by knowing your environment and the situation a bit better. Thank you. We love you, Ken. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jay, Pete, Mark. Hey, everybody. Um, Greetings from the road. I'm in Chicago still, heading out, heading back west tomorrow via the northern route, which uh, I'm excited about to get back on the road. Um, have been not only you know uprooted and leaving the west coast during the smokes in our town and our valley getting pretty seriously burnt, um, but making it into a road trip and visiting the um, grandparents and giving you know kind of doing doing the love action really um, to, 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 to spread that around, bring the grandkids to the grandparents and, um, and launching three programs along the way. So I actually launched um, two programs on September 10th with my car um, backed in and packed in Ashland with the, um, with the smoke levels at like 500. And it was just the day. And I think this is, I mean, I spoke to this a couple of weeks ago, but I think it still sticks with me that this is, this is the kind of times that we're in, not necessarily that we're going to be uprooted, hopefully entirely, um, but that we, that a semi-nomadic uh, process is, uh, is, is worthy of recognition and um, sometimes not all that bad. And so uh, from the road, 
Um, the programs that I've been working on, I think maybe are worth mentioning a couple. One of them is a, um, a social enterprise uh, storytelling program, which I've been really excited about and uh, working with a couple of different groups. And the, the format is basically my kind of keynote, but it's an interactive keynote that leads into, you know, why do we tell stories? How do we tell stories, et cetera? What do we mean by story? Um, and then doing these kind of duad, duo or triad uh, breakouts that get them then in these other sessions telling stories to each other. And it was really cool. It was like Sierra Leone and Nigeria, India, a bunch of India, um, South, South America, South Africa, and every time. So every morning I'd wake up and get on another call with these folks all around the world. And I really came out super inspired um, just by the transformations that I'm witnessing and also my humble ability to be able to kind of move the dial in framing story uh, for them and their greater journeys and being able to see beyond what they say and kind of help to recalibrate it in a way that seemingly, seemingly really was making sense. So um, I'm excited about that. And um, the other program I'm doing is, uh, it's called Mythic Moments. And I'm bringing together um, founders that I've worked with before that are um, kind of everybody's like meeting this innermost cave moment and saying like, where are we going now? Where are we headed into the future? And basically gathering um, through this process, kind of gathering the moments of wonder, uh, those early moments of wonder, sometimes the ones that thread us through our lives that we kind of end up plasticizing and framing into some sort of meaning um, and then releasing that kind of frame and just gathering the wonder and gathering the struggle that, of the journeys we've already gone on, the innermost caves that we've already faced and the lessons we've pulled from it and kind of weaving together to meet a story of today. And what I'm really excited about in that, that's um, highly experimental as I'm kind of navigating through this process and on the road is to first of all, work with a constellation of people that have already like deepened themselves in the territory of story and have already been speaking publicly and writing books, et cetera, in this territory, but to figure out not only how we develop a new story um, for today, considering the transformations we've faced and the wonders we've gathered, but also in a way that um, walks us into a future as we're witnessing everyone else walk into their future. And so it's kind of like this dovetailing journey curve idea that I've, that I've spoken with uh, in various forms that how our stories come together to create something. And so I'm also excited and deep into that. And the last piece that I'll throw in, which is related, is, you know, I'm navigating my own turmoil, my own grief, my own struggle with where are we, how are we doing this, what, what I'm absorbing on Facebook and in the news, and really trying to, you know, I know we speak about presencing, just really wanting to presence the fear um, without succumbing to a story that I don't want to be a part of. So I think that we, we create these, and I, and I haven't done the deep brain science on this, and I'm really intrigued too. This is kind of the first time I've been excited about brain science in a while because it's such a, it's a kind of a burden for me. But why do we leverage these negative futures um, overwhelmingly so we can try, I know we try to predict around futures. That's why we're gathering information and trying to like navigate through these stories, but why gather them and try to create such a terrible future when there's so much wonder that actually does exist and how do we balance all of this in a way that can keep, not only keep us stable, but enable some air to, you know, navigate and breathe in so we can travel into a future and be present in a future that we want to. And I really appreciate Neil, you talking about 500 years. I've been thinking a lot about a hundred years. I really am intrigued by a hundred years. How do we get, how do we set a long course, give up ourselves in a way and our, you know, and be present for what the power is today and walk into it. Thank you. Jay, thank you so much. Um, maybe two things. One is I'd love to know how OGM can be some form of little platform for you or support for you or other thing in these things you're building, which are very OGM-y, all of them. <clears throat> um, so let's think through Me that. Too. 
And, and then the second thing is I noted in the, in the chat, like several countries are offering because tourism has gone down the crapper. So some nice places like Barbados and Bermuda and other countries are offering digital nomad visas where it's like you go there and you can work and stay. It's, it's not like a permanent residency visa, but you can stay for long periods of time. They just want you to work there and you know, contribute to the economy and occupy some spaces that would formerly have been occupied by a tourist for three days. So stay for six months. Um, and if, if, uh, if Trump for some crazy reason squeaks through and wins this one or, or if other chaos descends, I know me to him. Um, uh, April and I are going to avail ourselves of digital tourist, uh, digital nomad visas for a while. Um, one last part, uh, yeah. it's a promotion. Um, Hip Camp is awesome. So Hip Camp is a new app. It's kind of like the Airbnb without structure and it's perfect for COVID. You travel and these, you just sign up, you read the reviews on these places and you sign up and you bring either your tent or you do glamping or whatever. But I really believe in the necessity for an intelligent network based on trust of place. And Hip Camp is the best. I've been thinking about this for a long time and Hip Camp is the best run at it that I've seen. So just check it out. That's awesome. And Neil had a brief comment. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah, thanks for that, Jay. Um, just picking up one more thing I didn't mention, I've been involved with listening to Thomas Hubel's Collective Trauma uh, Conference, which is a series of amazing interviews and speakers. Uh, we've only seen a couple of days of that full, there's about 10 days of work and we've purchased the set of the information for that. But the Healing Ancestral Trauma, Collective Trauma is a bit like what Jay was saying about you know, going into the cave or coming out of the ancestral cave. But when Anne and I were talking about that, part of the journey is to heal the trauma from the past. The other is to heal the preemptive trauma from the closing window of opportunity because we currently have impossible dreams of the future. The dreams that we have projecting the current into the future will not exist. So it's not about dystopia. It's how do we redirect the energies that will otherwise be spent doing things which are worthless because they won't get there. How do we hold the energy to redirect our uh, our new narratives through that narrowing Overton window, because if we don't, then we're screwed. And so finding that capacity to find that gap through there, holding both the trauma of the past and avoiding the trauma of the future by redirecting, let's link into everything from OGM to education, to consciousness, to you know, it's all of those things. And that's part of where and now what is going. Thank you, sorry, too long. Well, that's okay. And I agree with, with all you said. One tiny detail, I don't think the Overton window is narrowing. I think that's a different window you're talking about, a window of opportunities. Overton is the, uh, the window of acceptable discourse and that has been shredded by Trump basically. So the, the Overton window is lying ragged and, and way, way too, too open now. Yeah, sorry, um, confusion, but, but in my okay. case, stretching, stretching the boundaries of the conversation to include yeah. collapse is actually opening the Overton window to say there's a narrow window of opportunity. So forgive me, I confused the two. Two different, two different windows, but, but yeah. I, I like the application of the windows a lot. And part of what my speech was about on Monday, I was like, the, the title of the speech is Trust is the Only Way Forward, um, because the other scenarios all suck. And so we need to figure out how to come back into the things you're describing so that we can paint good visions of our future and then just go build them because the different the distance between reality and code right now is is, is like pretty short you know um and and the distance between code and physical stuff in the world is a little bigger but not necessarily that huge so i think that's uh, all super interesting stuff uh and charles you wanted to jump in briefly thanks yeah i was um just that neil what you were just sharing um uh, ties exactly into Tom Atley, what Roma was referring to, and some of us here were, were involved in those conversations um, in regard to collective sense making and also uh, kind of seeing through the lens of what another um, associate of Tom's, as Martin Rausch, has called uh, wise adaptation. So it connects with the Jem Bentel and deep, deep adaptation, but uh, there's a lot more to come. And actually, finally, uh, it seems that Tom is coming around to blog about this stuff. Um, so stay tuned for that. But uh, yeah, more on that later. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. So let's go Mark, Judy, Klaus, Charles. Good morning or good evening for Charles and people in Europe. I, I, I never thought I would hear someone living in Belgium welcoming the rain. Um, yeah, right. Um, 
Um, I'm from Australia. We like rain there. <laughs> right, right. But it does. You know, I mean, I'm French, so we always have that joke uh, about people in the north um, being wet all the time. Um, but that's true. That that things change. Um, I'm I'm working on. Uh, Oh, and, and, and these two guys, yeah, I know I'm, I'm, I'm entertaining my, my image of a, a, a social anarchist, but um, they're great examples of resiliency. And no matter, you know, how they perceived and what they've done in their lives and, and so forth, um, they, they stayed um, steady against old odds. And, and, and for that, they're examples. Uh, in terms of book for the future, so I'm going to drop that quickly um, because if when I do have my virtual background I cannot show anything so here mm. our story is a future that's by Nick Estes who is a native historian um, so I recommend that I started it I haven't finished it but it's a it's a great book um, I've been contacted by an organization and I would love to have, it's kind of a, would love to have you guys, um, uh, opinion about it. And I joined in, um, without thinking twice because the, um, the framing of the issue was so appealing to me. So it's called no deal for nature. Um, and, and the website is no deal for nature.org. Um, which uh, fights against the push to put aside 30% of nature for conservation and say like, like this, it doesn't make much sense, right? Um, but it says that instead we should respect indigenous people's rights. And if these rights are enforced, enforced, then we don't need to set aside 30% of nature since um, they occupy about that much of terrestrial land um, and have rights over that. Um, so so I, would love, I would love to, um, um, to have you guys feedback and, and, and what you think of this approach. I don't know how, how familiar all of you are with that that push for to set aside thirty percent of. I had not heard of the New Deal for Nature, so No Deal for Nature is like twice removed uh, stuff I wasn't familiar with, and it sounds really interesting. Briefly, because I'm a big believer that humans who know what they're doing are good for nature, so we should live on the land and do you know do good things for it. Mm -hmm. And someone recently had suggested, what if we take what if we take all the national parks? and turn them over to all the Native American populations because yeah. we've, we've shoved them off basically into the worst corners of the country. They have the, the crappiest pieces of real estate because that's all that was left when we stole the rest. And so what if we just gave them all the national parks and turned over their, their shepherding, et cetera, right? So things like that. So I, I love this idea. Yeah, yeah, and that's, and that's definitely something that I've been pushing. I mean, I've been saying, you know, um, in every conversation that I have, um, feel it's it's kind of it's kind of bizarre it's not bizarre but but it is because it's coming like such at at, at a late point in time that uh like for instance in california we're starting to allow native americans to do control burn but there's something that they've done you know they've they've been banned to do um mm -hmm. since since the uh late 19th century that early um, I think I think that there was completely banned in 1920, some, somewhere around that. So it, it and it's causing absolutely, I mean, it's wrecking about about the the, the north right now. Um, I want I want also to to remind all of us that our democracy here in the United States has been designed for white people. Right. So it's it's not like any democracy in the world you know, a democracy, it's more like a republic in France, has been designed for French. It's a, it's a big difference mm -hmm. in terms of approach and, and vision and, and views. Um, and, and finally, I just wanted to, uh, to, to express um, 
to you guys, whoever watched um, the debate yesterday, that I have a, a huge deal of respect uh, for you guys who have um, let yourself be subjected to that, although sometimes I question your sanity. Agreed. Totally agree. Um, let's go Judy, Klaus, Charles, Doug, Matt. That's our... Well, I'm trying to, I guess I'm personally just trying to continue to stay centered and do what I can do about whatever situation I'm in. Uh, it's, it feels like the right thing to do and <clears throat> it fits with my basic framework of life. But I'm d very disturbed by the tone in almost all of the people that I interact with a sense of loss or hopelessness or fear or anger. Um, so the day to day is interesting in contrast to my typical really long view of the world. And I think that the kind of conversations we're having, um, and Neil, I appreciated very much your comments about the long games. <laughs> um, I think whatever we can do to take that to every setting we're in, in addition to making it broadly available somehow to people in a more manageable, easy to consume dose or small bites or something. Because I'm sensing that the energy for many people, they're so on the edge, they're not thinking about anything but the next six to 24 hours. And I think that's a challenge for us in terms of creating anything that's meaningful. And we wanna get it right which often takes a long time. And so it's sort of like, it, you know, make, make a little, sell a little was the 3M thing, um, just because you found out what was really needed. But maybe instead of trying to wrap our arms around the whole project, we should think about daily dispensing of nibble bites that people could consume. And in easy to consume things, whether they're cartoons or graphics or symbology or you know, slogans just that are opposing the craziness that's around us. Because I think people will snag on to those. I, I don't have the answer, but I, I'm just sensing that all the people I'm interacting with don't have the energy for a meaningful discussion most of the time. Um, so doing that, Judy, would be pretty trivially easy technically. I mean, we could create a shared Instagram account or something else. We, should, we, we could pick a technology that everybody's aware of that's really popular and then get whoever feels like it to come donate. And each of us posts small, and, and I'm, I, from the words you just used, I'm thinking of this as small windows into a more hopeful future, <clears throat> um, which could be stories, could be pointers to written pieces, could be a paragraph quote out of uh, some of the books that are going through our chat, could be anything, right? Um, but, but done in a way that anybody can subscribe to. And I think, I think as an Instagram uh, channel, for example, it would be super, super popular because um, people are looking for these things. The other image that came to mind for me as you were saying that was um, from Ender's Game, the, char the two characters, the siblings that created oppositional points of view and became virtual communicators and debated those in doseable bites and developed a huge following and tremendous influence maybe there's a way to do something like that where we could end up with i don't know tens of thousands of followers listening to the debate <laughs> and <clears throat> moving their thought process in the same kind of way and that would really fit with what we're kind of doing already but um, I, I can't remember the names of the two characters in ender's game but i know that it was the sister and brother yeah. and they, they created identities mm. for each other and my daughter and i actually talked about doing that years ago, um, just because we thought it would be fun. I love the application of Ender's Game here. That'd be, that'd be really, uh, really awesome. Uh, one of my favorite sort of vloggers on YouTube are the Hank and, Hank and John Green, the vlog brothers. <clears throat> They're among my, my favorite role models because they've created so much interesting stuff. They invented nerd criteria, a bunch of other things, but they have this game where they're not taking two different opinions but they're playing as if they're always talking to each other. So like, Hank, like you said on Wednesday, blah, 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 blah. And then they'll say something really interesting and useful as quickly, sort of briefly as they can. Um, that's interesting too. But the idea of creating oppositional points of view or, um, uh, so I own the domain, thedoomslayer.com. 
uh, just for fun. Because uh, Jamey Cassio is all the master of doom and we were joking and he's like, well, you're kind of optimistic even though you say a lot of doom. So, <clears throat> so I could create a character on Instagram called the Doomslayer, for example, and then someone else could create another one and we could do, <clears throat> and the question is, are you on one channel or several? Sorry to make this longer than it should be on a, on a check-in, but I love the idea, Judy. Um, uh, and oh, Julian, sorry that you're not, not doing well. Um, and I'm not, that's too bad. Uh, so Peter and Valentine Wigan, thank you so much. That was uh, exactly. Uh, so now I have to scroll way up to find the, the, the rest of the check-ins. Uh, Klaus, Charles, Doug, and Matt. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it feels like it was a year ago that we met last time it, with uh, mm -hmm. What, uh, what, what went through, but in my particular uh, focus area, um, we had uh, uh, some, some amazing uh, breakthroughs and, and you feel the energy starting to, to really build. The Rodel Institute just came out uh, last week with a report, I'm, I'm posting it here, which is a white paper that uh, uh, summarizes uh, uh, the, the science related to soil. And they're arguing and, and they're proving that uh, we could basically neutralize the entire carbon output of humanity if we were to shift into uh, regenerative uh, practices, into regenerative soil management. So this is really gaining uh, significant attention and then I guess, I don't know what uh, um, precipitated it, but the, I don't know what precipitated it, but the, the energy uh, that people are bringing to wanting change and looking for uh, what can I do and, and how can I uh, uh, protect myself and others is really building up. So, you know, I'm working at grassroots level um, so now the, the, uh, the business climate leader and citizen climate lobby organizations have totally dedicated resources to what we're doing with setting up teams to address farmers. Um, so we have two teams, one towards industrial farmers um, the, uh, uh, and the Farm Bureau, which has one conversation uh, that's completely different from the other group that is uh, working with organic farmers multi-crop farmers, you know, family farmers, smaller groups. Um, and we are developing communication on the, a messaging that is appropriate for either one because they live in, in a different world each. You know, they're looking at things completely differently. So I have, uh, we have advanced, this is the storyline now, it's about 80% complete now. I mean, I've, I've uh, posted, uh, you know, it took a couple of weeks to, to get to where it is now. But we have a storyline laid out and we are adapting that storyline now to different segments of people we're talking with. Um, I mean, <clears throat> this is also now happening in Congress. You now we, we have uh, several, um, uh, 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 um, I mean, a, a, a growing list of legislators who are beginning to understand that this is the only way forward really to, uh, um, to to get uh, to get us through uh, you know, the, this transition into into a new future here. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I I've been looking at science at this particular you know climate change and the relationship between the food supply and the environment and 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 uh, uh, where, we're, where we're heading and it is not a good place as Neil was saying before. I mean, the options in front of us are really pretty scary and so shifting the way we grow food and, and the way we uh, uh, treat the environment is really, is really the first step here. So anyway, I'm, I'm actually quite excited because uh, I, I see so much energy uh, flowing into this effort here. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing. Thank you, Klaus. Um, Charles, Doug, Matt, and then Lauren. Everyone from Zurich. Um, as always, a lot going on, but really glad to be here. And in trying to sort uh, how to pack in um, here and now, one one thing that's been really alive um, at Kiko Lab lately is um, conflict and 
conflict resolution, reconciliation. This is um, an area that Lauren and I came together around um, already two years ago at this point, around uh, that time, um, talking about it, ideating around it. And um, actually then uh, that was the end of two years ago. And then moving into early part of last year, um, Lauren, uh, started the, the PKE, which has been mentioned here, the Practical Knowledge Ecology. So Lauren, I'm really glad you, you made it here. Um, and maybe you can fill in a little bit. Uh, um, the, the issues um, of the moment at Kiko Lab are, are around decentralization, data sovereignty, um, trust networks, these kind of things, kind of really juicy stuff. Um, so we had a bit of a flare up in our session on Monday and, and um, in a, in a private thread with some of you here as who were present, um, we're working it out. And uh, hopefully we can, well, we will be following up on Monday. Um, we're not sure who all will show up, but um, uh, yeah, so that's happening. Um, the, the thing which um, <laughs> on the personal side that, that happened um, this weekend, my younger daughter's first grade teacher tested positive for the coronavirus. And um, I was with my daughters um, at the time throughout the weekend. So I only just found out sort of at the end of the weekend. Um, not my choice, but um, Claire, that's my six-year-old. She went back to school and everything's sort of normal. And, and it looks like everyone's fine. Both, both kids are fine. But um, here in Switzerland, um, they are doing some measures of distancing and stuff. Masks are not required for teachers. There's a lot of stuff um, that, that I'll leave out right now, but, but um, it's, it's been tough. And then um, pretty much uh, the beginning of this week, I ran into a housemate of mine up on the, on the roof. We have a garden up there. And um, it seems like he probably has, has the virus too, um, but he's a denier. He's like, I don't believe in the virus. And I said, well, just, don't die this week, please. Just go get yourself checked out. <laughs> um, the other thing uh, that is continuing with what I was sharing last week is I'm digging deeper and deeper into our repositories and, and just trying to clean house and refine how we're keeping things, not just a Kiko lab, but my own stuff that I've been sitting on also very much around the, the PKE and um, a lot of other big initiatives kind of collecting things. So, yeah, moving into position to kind of focus and articulate and, and go for funding um, with some of you here as well, um, offering a lot of wonderful inputs. Um, last thing on the wonderful input side is Peter Dowson, whom some of you met in the story room um, in Australia with the story canvas. Um, he actually, uh, Jay, is still really taken by the, sto the, uh, the, 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 curve, the journey the story, the journey curve. Um, and uh, is using that also with his canvas. And um, I will dig up and, and possibly read um, some brief things that he put together around our learning gardens, uh, ideation learning pods. Um, Great, thank you, Charles. Yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's more to say. I did mention about Tom Atley. I think that's really gonna come around um, and I'll try to bring, maybe bring him in, in here or, or as that stuff is emerging, um, it'll be directly relevant. Stacy. Um, back to your point or you know quite sort of request questions um i'm really not inclined to make sense out of scattered bits of messenger uh, face, facebook messenger communications um sorry and that's the first thing that i wrote is like please just email me uh, an outline you know and bring put it all in one place um that's not on me to try to you know align line those pieces so that's just not you know my process um <clears throat> and and just maybe left Lauren, maybe well, you Stacey, just, right hang on. Yeah. It, it, let me just finish. Um, so okay. that the P, the PKE, the Practical Knowledge Ecology, um, was born. You know, was sort of born out of um, some of us getting a bit um, worn out from the GCC, the Global Commun uh, Challenges Communication uh, Collaboration Group, um, talking and talking, talking a lot, and not doing stuff. So we were trying to get shit done um, in the PKE, and that didn't work out um, for various reasons. Um, and so Kiko Lab was actually born out of the ashes of the PKE. Um, and so I think that's enough for me for, for now. Um, thanks, great, great to be here. Thanks, Charles. Um, and I think as we 
bump our way toward a better future. We're going to shed some skins. We're going to figure out how to do things better. We're going to build some bridges. We're going to sort of sort these things out and it's going to be a little chaotic here and there. Um, so I think we're, <clears throat> and all of that would happen if there weren't a pandemic and a crazy ass election and a bunch of other things going on. So, so thank you for, for sharing what you did. Um, let's go to Doug, Lauren, and then Matt. Okay, well, here I am on the Russian River in Northern California, buried in smoke once again. It's like reminds me of when I was a kid and had a tropical fish tank and forgot to clean it. That's what the air feels like. Uh, it's not comfortable. Uh, the big thing here, I think, is, uh, well, I want to start very logistically. If I had the screen that I'm looking at, and could click on a person and get the equivalent of a Jerry's Now page, I would find this a pretty amazing uh, medium, especially if I could drive, drag the pictures around and put them in clusters that are of interest to me. It would, seems to me it would be almost a complete medium. Uh, the week is uh, coming up, I'm finishing a draft of this book called Garden World Politics. And the idea of Garden World Politics is that we should design around major human needs, uh, food, habitat, and meaning, and make it a coherent aesthetic project uh, for the future. Uh, it implies that the current systems are kind of breaking down first, which I think they are. Observations from this week. Uh, several bureaucracies that I am involved with, more or less, are falling apart. One is a cooperative of artists, 200 artists, and basically they can't make anything happen and people are resigning from all the leadership positions. Not good. Uh, the next one is a state commission on health uh, with a group of physicians who are basically volunteers on this commission, but they are ceasing to meet because they have no budget. Uh, and what I see is this uh, kind of pulling apart of the social fabric that isn't quite being noticed yet, but each of those people is gonna have less income, which means that it can buy less stuff. Uh, and it's a ripple effect that, that is really still ongoing. Certainly Disney firing 28,000 people uh, is, is part of that. Um, one of the big resistances to the future that keeps things from moving is land ownership. It's very hard to experiment with land when it's owned by somebody who doesn't want it to change. And it seems to me the pressure on land uh, boundaries is going to increase and something interesting has to happen there. I don't know what it is, but I see it as a real uh, point for the future. So those are some of the things on my mind. Thank you, Doug. So, so many interesting issues just bouncing around here. Um, I mentioned in the chat that John Wesley Powell uh, proposed to the sent to the US government that we organize the new Western states, because at the time they were just rolling in around watersheds, which is super interesting. And it would be really, and, and it makes me think that it would be super interesting to have an overlay world government that's organized around bioregions and watersheds and to just start getting together around that and say, where does that take us? What do we do? How do we re-sacralize Re, you know, re-spiritualize our relationship to land, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that there's all, all kinds of interesting opportunities there. Klaus, go ahead. Yeah, Doug, the, the, uh, the issue of land management, what uh, the Cohen Climate Solutions Act is uh, working on to do is to actually pay people to sequester carbon into the soil on a per ton basis. So it's creating a revenue stream and that idea is really uh, catching on. There are uh, a number of revenue sources that are being added to the discussion uh, as we speak. I see this as the only practical way to uh, incentivize people to, to do this, you know, to move to, to, to uh, treat the land. Mm -hmm. I like it, it makes sense. Um, let's finish our, our round. We're well over the hour, but this has been one of the richest check-ins ever. Uh, Lauren, then Matt. And Lauren, you're in motion. Sorry to catch you at a oh. mobile <laughs> time, but go ahead. <laughs> I'm being 
painting and I won't uh, waste the energy. I'm just trying to keep my head above water. We're moving uh, and I'm redoing my new house. So uh, yeah, don't have much time for anything else at this point. So I'm just painting. So Thank you for being in the call. That's going to be my check-in for this week. Yeah, but I can't miss OGM. <laughs> Love it too much. <laughs> Lauren, actually, I, w I wonder yeah. if I might keep you just a moment because okay. um, that just uh, maybe just before you jumped in, there was some touching on uh, regarding the debates. And, and Lauren and I had a call earlier today, um, and Lauren had this idea to uh, um, show clips of the debates in our cool laboratory with the kids um, with, uh, with a kind of um, uh, framing re relating to different um, types of um, arguments. It, it, there was a podcast Lauren um, saw that, that broke down different different types of de debate tactics. And um, so sort of actually teaching kids about debate tactics and using the, the debate um, as an example. So Lauren, I don't know if I, I'm butchering this, but I, I'm sort of conflicted about this idea. Uh, One thought yeah, that's would be what... to reduce those clips to four or five frame cartoons for the children um, rather than the actual verbiage um, and just show very short clips of angry body language because I think the behavior in the debate was very much like toddler tantrums. Um, you don't need more than about six to ten seconds of that to see it but then maybe some cartoon that the children could relate to and discuss or play out in a play or whatever. Go ahead, yeah. Lauren. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's it. I mean, I don't have uh, anything. Uh, I don't think it's, pr it's pressing for the whole group. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you, guys. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting concept, although I think a lot of that was um, too rough for kids. So like NS, NSFK, <clears throat> um, how do, how, and, and Judy's Judy's approach might actually sort of temper it enough that it, it, it's dealable. And then that from a guy who believes that very young kids are actually capable of processing really difficult things and that, you know, that's doable. Uh, but, but that was just a mugging. It was a complete intentional mugging <clears throat> at the debate. It was incredible. Um, Matt, you have the, the last word in the check-in round. Maybe I just start with the debates. Um, and um, say that my 15-year-old uh, daughter asked me if I were watching them, and then, um, and then we talked about it the day after, and she was very insightful uh, in her comments and thoughts about them. Um, and uh, I just thought it was really uh, interesting, and she's now engaged, and we're going to watch the next debates together. And this is from a kid who you know, wasn't necessarily fully engaged in, in those things. So maybe that's a good, you know, some goodness out of what's coming, right? Um, and uh, I've been, uh, based on Doug's advice, I've been reading uh, Bruno Latour, um, Down to Earth. And um, it's, a, it's an incredibly important book. Um, it's also an incredibly difficult book to get your head around, right? And part of the things that I, I I really appreciate about it is he doesn't collapse to vilifying um, kind of the, the, some of the Trumpian ideas, right? He definitely talks about them as being um, a challenge, but he tries to put them into context of why we've gotten to where, where we are. And part of it is that we've been living in a, in a world where we've been fighting um, uh, against two different versions of utopia, right? The utopia of the indigenous, where we all go back to the land and, you know, we live in communes and everything is harmonious and, um, you know, very local, right? And the utopia of a global, a global world, right? I mean, each of those global and local also have a sort of a dystopian view of, of them. And what ended up happening in, in all of that was the fact that um, that neither of them will work. Um, you know, we've been running these experiments with um, human civilization now for a very long time. And I think what we're realizing is the, um, the epoch that we're on right now in this experiment that we've been doing as a, as a, human, as a human race, um, you know, both directions are failed. Um, and you can see where they're going. And part of it is in those 
in both of those directions, we, we have further distanced ourselves from, from the natural world, right? We see everything from, from afar, if you will. Um, we see our planet from afar, we see the natural world from afar versus um, sort of becoming of the earth again and be seeing ourselves as just a part of the, uh, you know, the terrestrial being, right? This very, very thin crust of life, right? If you think about, you know, it's not earth that's sort of unique and special. It is this very thin layer um, between our atmosphere and, um, and, you know, kind of the crust of this planet. Um, and we are of it and, and a lot of people, um, it's not our pale blue dot, right? That's part of what he says. He says that that, that, that distance um, has actually caused us to, to miss out on the natural world. We see ourselves as actually not a part of, but we get to examine it objectively and rationally. Um, and I think, I think the reaction that's coming from, um, you know, coming from uh, sort of not only the extreme right, but also the extreme you know, the extreme left um, is a denial of kind of what's going on in the terrain um, in the terrestrial world. And so, you know, I consider myself pretty progressive. I consider myself pretty left and um, became a semi-nomad like Jay at the beginning of this pandemic for a variety of, of reasons. And um, in that process, my irrigation system at in my little small plot of land that I have here in, in Needham was turned off. Um, and when I got back home, um, I failed to put it, put it back on. And I've been watching my, my own landscape brown. I've been watching certain plants die, but I've also been watching certain plants continue to be green and to grow. And, and that in and of itself is, was a recognition for me that I wasn't actually connected to the changes that are going on in this world. And if we all turned off our irrigation systems, just that alone, if we all stopped trying to manipulate nature and just watched how it's playing out, I think we would have a better realization of what's going on with, with, um, with the climate change that we're dealing with. And then maybe instead of me planting lawn, I plant a different type of, you know, different type of garden. And so, um, um, uh, it leads me down to this path, which is I've been talking a lot about these things now to a lot of different people. Um, and I'm becoming that crazy person. I'm becoming that person that won't shut up about these topics. As Judy said, there's a, there's a relative, a, a very short patience for the deep conversation. I mean, this book here, I, can't, I can barely understand it. And I consider myself a smart individual. And I was talking to Scott, who you know, um, you know, in the background of the chat says, well, how do I, how do I participate with these people on this call? And I think, you know, the, the deeper we get here, the more esoteric, the more challenging uh, these concepts are because they're, they're a fundamental shift. And I think that's the challenge. The challenge is the left, the right, the wrong, you know, globalism, localism, all the metaphors, all the things we've lived by, all of these, all of these defining concepts have to be shed and and that requires almost um the help of of us to simplify and to make these things just really tangible and really real and you can't do that until you get a picture of the whole um and i think the problem is as i was talking to one of my clients about a project that i'd love to you know send this document it's sort of a proposal of of what to do with corporate america to build sort of this 21st century consulting organization which is about um, showing leadership what actually is happening versus what they think is happening based on the mental models of business and mental models of um, you know, their MBAs and, and the economy and all this stuff and how um, the economic realities and even our economists fail to put nature into the picture because it's something other, it, does, it isn't an actor, it is a, it is a resource. We've defined it as a resource, right? We've defined it as something that we live on, we, we take from. And I think the, these, you know, these things are very, very difficult. And the question of is where do you start? The answer is you, you have to just start. You can't, you can't pick something 
and prove it out because it, they want to prove it out within the existing mental models. And we're talking about real frame breaking here. And I, I can't, I can barely break my own frame, let alone break other people's frames because it's just, it's just really hard to get your head around. And I'm starting to sound like the crazy person now. And I, you know, I was listening to, you know, Stacy's well, but, 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 you know, Stacy went off on this thing, um, uh, earlier today and, you know, Kiko lab and, um, what you guys are doing and what, like these things sound in my mind, they're hard to even comprehend what you're talking about. You know, and I consider myself a pretty smart person that can comprehend lots of different things. And yet what I hear people on this call talking about are hard for me to even comprehend, to, to know the language that you're using and all that stuff. And, and I'm sure you find the same thing with me. These become almost like these ramblings of heretics um, and crazy people and witches and, um, and I don't know how to deal with that yet. And I, I think that that's one of our, our fundamental challenge. Maybe the challenge right now is not for us to build, but for us to figure out how we even understand each other and how we simplify our work so that we can start to bring other people in because we can't even describe what this is um, to new people um, in a way that is the same. And so I think that's just kind of my, you know, my challenge right now. And I feel very optimistic about what this group is, but I'm also hoping it doesn't go the way of every other group that Doug's talking about, which is because we don't have access to resource, right? To the money, to the capital, to the time, to the space, to really work this. If we were a startup, we would be here every day, every hour, and we'd be working this, but we're you know, still cobbling together Thursday mornings um, and then discourse. So um, Jerry, I see your pushback and I'm, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to challenge, you know, challenge us to, to, to step back and, um, and to, you know, to figure out a way to turn the complexity of a book like this into some sort of simplicity that, um, that works for us being able to um, motivate others. Um, Matt, thank you. Let me go to Stacy and Charles for comments. Yeah, I, I just, I just want to say that um, that's sort of what I'm addressing is, is Sam Hahn's smart people problems. Okay, so that's, he's under me too. And so Charles, I'm sorry that you took it as a flare up because I was, I wasn't, I will, the reason that I write my things out in text is because I'm an intelligent adaptation personal designer. So I'm designing personally, I'm custom designing for every person and everybody that I work with, we're going to have a one on one session. That's how I develop the templates for the toolkit, the organizational toolkit that we're going to sell. And practical knowledge ecology, I'm on top of that because that's where I learned a lot. And it didn't work. And I, don't, I know why it didn't work. And unfortunately, I was really hurt by that. And I had to heal from that. And I've healed. And I bring with me the wisdom of the mother. So that's, that's, I don't expect to be, see, I know you get that part. There are, we, we're all, that's the thing. This is about, I designed for inclusion. My system is based on inclusion and choice. And so what I want to propose right now, because this would be the teaching game, you all are your own DAO, because we're also building a game to test DAOs a scientific measurable way to test it. And the way that I've taken all the good things in the world and instead of throwing them away, I just want to shift them. And that's a feminine shift. And that's why I would love Judy to be on a team with me and Lauren, one triangle. And Lauren, I had shown you stuff last year. I don't know what you remember about it and what's there or not. The only reason that I brought it up on the call, Charles, is because that's the breadcrumb that I'm leaving. So while I'm gone, since I can't do everything because I'll be sick, I'm like the mother. I'm toxic. I'm sick. You guys, you guys pissed all over me. I can't take it anymore. I'm going to throw up. So the name of my program, and it's a full, it's a comprehensive, there's healing, there's arts. The project started with the question. It's always about the question. 
what would an economy designed to support cultural creatives look like? This is my seed. All I want to do is perfect, perfect my seed because I know if I have the perfect seed, I can leave that creation and I can go off and build new dreams. In practical knowledge ecology, I left the story of Anastasia. That's me telling in one mode, story form. My work is spread all over Facebook. And this project, the reason it's a reality show concept, it's a hybrid. I've taken all the things that work. We, we're all upset, many of us are upset about Trump. Trump, right now I have a team, the one that Jerry and Doug have in, been invited to oversee, and that's Michael Josefowitz. And by the way, we'll be giving tours. We're setting this up like an academic institution. So there are three tracks. Lauren, I'm glad you came on. I really want you there. But part of the, part of the, the golden rule for the new paradigm, there's only one rule. The golden rule is you cannot do anything that you don't want to do. If you do anything that you don't want to do, and you can have your own reasons for wanting it, that's between you and yourself. If you do anything you don't want to do, we all lose. That's the beat. That's I just all I want to do is this is my per, this is my creation, my story. Everybody has a story. I bring with me the women from generations before me. This is an intergenerational learning approach. This is. I want us all to win and I want us to do it our way and each have our own story. It's all about separating the people and I can do that. And I would like to prove it using one global mind. At, you're going to be your own DAO, your own DAO. And the first challenge I have, and I would ask, and you could, I would ask Judith, Lauren, Charles, and me to work together in the first, in the first four-sided figure. That's where our idea is going to stem. And, I want, and you're going to help me finish the rest of my templates because I have a whole bunch of templates, a whole bunch of stuff. They're not filled out because that's the fun. The fun is in the game. The old world, they keep jumping ahead. They want to get to the end. They want to win. They're missing out on the journey. So please join me. If you're interested, show up, message me. I'd like to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. I'd like to sit with you, design your... It's called Starlight, Star Bright, because we, we work with the stars and everyone's a star, but we have to separate them into constellations, otherwise it's chaos. So Stacey, that's what I'm working on. Yeah. Stacey, I, um, I hear your passion, I hear your energy, and I hear your frustration. Yeah. Um, I hear all of that stuff. Um, I also hear you know, sort of the words and the invitation. I, what I don't know is I don't understand what you're what you're talking about, I know. right? I, um, I'm, con I'm confused and I, I fear that when we get this to this place, myself included, that um, it almost becomes incomprehensible to other people and so then we're shut out from that world. And so, you know, because you're on this call, I'm, you know, I give, you know, I give the patience to try to understand um, but if we weren't in this kind of intimacy that's, you know, been brought up by Open Global Mind, I wouldn't give you a second thought. I would, I would sort of move on from the heresy. That would be good. That would be a good thing. So but tell me, but I don't let's, even, let's, but I don't understand. So, and I don't mean that in a, just a Matt Stacy thing. I mean that with all of us, right? I mean, you know, with Neil, we had conversations and Charles, we've had conversations and, and you know, Lauren, I just like, what is the sh what is the sh what is the shape of of things? Um, it's hard to penetrate. So let me let me step in for just a second because we're at ninety minutes, which is a long call. Um, and I wanted to get to Romer's excellent question, which we're probably not going to get to this call, but I'd like to start next call with. Um, and I just want to offer two things, which is, OGM is I describe it as a container because it's meant to hold experiments like what Stacy's describing. And Stacy, this is the first time hearing about the, the, the nexus of things that you're working on. I will approach it with a completely open mind and I will give you feedback about my own responses to the invitation, the process, what goes on and so forth. 
what you've been getting some on the call here from people who've been experienced what you've been doing more. But I think that one of the best things that OGM could do is to help one another find the best expression of these experiments because somewhere in these experiments lies the next communications medium and the next way we all figure out how to understand each other and how to make sense of the world together. And it's gonna be uncomfortable up front. It's gonna be some pieces of the next one are not gonna feel like books and magazines and web blogs and tweets. And thank God for that. Like, like I am praying that our next world for how we connect with each other and get to some interesting better place together doesn't smell like Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, but that's what we're stuck with right now for the basis for experimenting. So it's really interesting that you just went, went all in on Facebook and said like, well, all right, we're all, we're all trapped on Facebook. Let's use that to start try, to try to see this. So I will approach it that way. Um, for, for, for all the bad stuff that Facebook has, has done to us and, and for us, I, I totally agree. Um, so, um, so let me pass it to Charles and let's have just a couple comments and then go out of this call and sit with this and I will enter your, your, your offer, Stacy, and see how that goes. Go ahead, Charles. Um, there's a bunch there and I'll try to be brief. There's uh, a whole lot on the table right now and I, I, I totally understand. So um, I and we, Lauren and I and the PKE group were sort of implicated and ex ex accused just now. So I, I should respond somehow. One thing is, the, um, and, and there's a long history to all this and, and it's really not for now. Um, but, um, but it's all there and I have it all extremely well documented. It's like unbelievable, um, the repository there. And I was able to call up immediately, Stacy, the story that you mentioned, and I sent it to you privately here in the Zoom chat in several Quite parts. Privately. I want to share, we're collaborating. Okay, that's up to you. Okay, now it's in several pieces because it was too long to go in a single Zoom message. So now you can piece it together like you were asking me to do in Facebook Messenger. So anyway, it's there for you, no problem. It was quick and easy to find because I saved it because it was really good. I saved it from last year, okay? And I could call it up immediately because we all need to be responsible for, for keeping track of what's important. We can't, we can't leave it in the hands of Facebook, um, you know, too bad. But, um, and just, the, just one more comment um, in regard to the Kiko Lab, um, Matt, you were, you know, still confused, and we're we're still a bit confused. We're we're kind of making it up as we go along, um, in terms of the languaging and how we can possibly articulate it. Um, we're getting better, and it, and we're building, and it, and it, it, there is rapid learning happening, and also in regard to some of the stories um, around the learning gardens and, and so forth. But but Kiko Lab at large, the collaboratory as a as a as a peer based um, innovation incubator. Um, it's, it's, it's wild and woolly and it's messy. And, and the language uh, doesn't exist just to kind of put it in a handy uh, package um, for newbies. It, it's not like that. And we need to actually um, combine and co-create the language um, and, and new language. This is, this is what we're doing. And this is really the hard work. And then just the last thing is the question of really who's the audience? And even, you know, the smart people in the room and, and others in our circles, um, you know, we're still um, trying to come together and, and figure this out. And then, and then from there, is, this isn't really for everyone, in my view, not yet, not right now. Um, so anyway, there's a lot more, but. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think confusion is a bad thing, right? I think, I think you know, we're sense-making here and we're making sense of each other's sense making. Um, and I think what I wanna, I wanna just maybe advocate for is that um, we, we, are, we are fair with each other about when we don't understand, that we, that we take the time to explain that we don't understand so that we can ultimately understand. And I find that a lot of times people just, if they don't understand, they disengage. And I think that's the opposite of where we need, we need to be. We need to be engaged in the tension, in the misunderstanding. And, and it's in the words misunderstood that we actually will be creative together, right? Um, at least that's my, you know, my belief. So confusion is a good thing only if we move through it toward a better understanding of each other. Um, 
I would just add, I mean, for us, at least for, from my side, I, I think, you know, understanding and all the kind of discourse, that's great and that's necessary. And that's the, the core, the, the basis to, to kind of go from there into action, into actually doing stuff, building stuff, even if it's messy, even if it's not, you know, ready, um, you know, just making it more tangible and concrete and practical. Back to that practical knowledge ecology, but where's the practical part in the understanding? Well, that, that's useful, but what are you going to do with that? So let's find our way through these different projects and different methods to something that actually works. Pete, did you want to jump in? Okay, I thought I saw you. Uh, Justin, jump in. Uh, Klaus, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think what I'm working on is really easy because when you think about soil, it's a macro uh, the term, you know, it's a macro perspective, which then rolls into all kinds of uh, activities that anyone can participate in. You know, as a uh, you know, going out buying groceries, you participate basically in the decision making process. But we are missing these macro signals in other parts of our conversation. And it, it has to come really down to the simplicity of a uh, of a uh, directional understanding. You know, so it, uh, and the only way I can explain it is, is in my context is if you focus on soil, everything else falls into place. We're missing this kind of macro context. Yes. I like that. Um, why don't we hit pause on our conversation there? I think that was a, a nice sort of grounding spot as well. And we've got lots to think about and lots to figure out um, where we are. Um, Neil, uh, Neil and Matt, last words. Jerry, you've seen the diagram that I drew recently. Uh, I'm not sure what the conversation has been about for the last 20 minutes. Um, the conversation, the diagram that I was trying to draw was to say, how do we use the tree analogy, the soil analogy, the garden analogy to look at the, the knowledge ecologies that are going on here, the stocks and flows that are in process, the, where the current values lie, where the current information lies, who has what stake in it, what are we going to do with it, right? All of these things are so critical. Um, at the moment, uh, both this online Global Mind and the peer-to-peer -peer wiki are large knowledge repositories curated by strange attractors in Jerry and in, in Michelle Bowens that have the capacity because of their reputation and the beautiful work that they've done to draw a lot of people in for whatever reason. There's also a lot of extraction going on. There's also a lot of anticipation about the potential value I could extract if I turned it into this or that or something else. The question is, for what? You remember I asked this question some time ago, uh, Jerry, and so what, right? All right, we're doing this stuff for what purpose? You know, the stories here are all spiraling upwards through some sort of transdisciplinary integration, story weaving, threading, whatever it might be. And if it's not for the benefit of humanity, then what the fuck are we doing? Right? And given we know we're in collapse, what the fuck are we doing? And given we know that this doesn't work, what the fuck are we doing? Right? So how do we get to this point where we actually know the different roles? And it's not about making it simple for everybody. It's about recognizing we have different levels of capability, maturity, understanding, consciousness, worldviews about how we hold this. How do we hold the container for this complexity? Right? And how do we ascribe with mutually assistive community-based rules, commons-based rules, containers around those that can hold it and have a noble obligation to turn it into something useful for others? And how do we somehow get return on investment for the maintenance of both the assets, the stocks, and the flows? Because unless we can change the way we're doing this stuff, we're screwed. And so we're sitting here on a couple of big opportunities like big libraries, but if nobody has a key, nothing happens, right? I saw the wonderful documentary recently on the, the library uh, people in Sarajevo that saved over 10,000 rare manuscripts by going through sniper fire during war because they knew that was what was needed, right? And so these are the cultural seeds of the past that need to be kept for the future because these are the things we've learned from in our evolution and our civilization. How do we preserve that seed bank? Now, online global mind might already be that seed bank, but where's the soil to plant it in? Who's going to tend the trees? 
How do we make sure the water comes at the right time? How do we bring in the right amount of humus? How do we not kill things? How do we not rec how do we recognise between a weed and a productive plant? And that sometimes they're the both 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 at the same time. So, to me, this is a knowledge ecology that we could be creating. It's not about how do we force it in one direction or the other, but how do we mutually respect and honour the different skills, the different and diverse functional elements of this ecology. And so that's the diagram I've got. I was going to share screens, but I can't at the moment, but I'd love to share that with the group. And I'm looking for the best way to do that because I don't think this Zoom call is the right place to do that. Um, how do we bring that sort of nucleus around which we can start to put some values into? Because unless we have some sort of common governance, I can't see this moving. And it's the same thing with peer to peer. Yeah, Neil, maybe just, um, I know, um I know Jerry had to drop off, but we talked about uh, a few weeks back about um, having an extended um, design conversation about these things. And I think it's time. And I've shirked my responsibility of getting it organized. Um, you know, we tried to put something out there asking what the objectives are. I think the objective is pretty simple. I think the objective is, you know, we need to design the soil, um, you know, metaphorically speaking, or the architectures for which um, people can participate um, and feel good about their participation and, and we're creating value. So my proposal um, is that uh, two weeks from today on um, Thursday the 15th, um, and we can start earlier if we need to for people who are um, on um, in European time, um, we have to think about California, but let's, uh, let's do an, an all day session. Let's give ourselves the space and time to actually move beyond check-in into, you know, a design conversation. Um, I don't know how people feel about that. Um, that week is on holiday with the kids, says Charles. Um, we, you know, we got to find a, we got to find a date. Um, and I don't know how far out we want to go. Um, it feels like, um, it feels like something. So, um, what what works for people in terms of a date? Do we want to go ahead with the 15th? Do we want to, um, you know, do we want to pick like October 29th, um, right before Halloween? Do we want to pick, you know, let's just pick a date. I think that's the first order of business. And since you guys had the patience of staying on the time, on the call, um, what do people can, can say? I'd like to do it after the 15th. I would definitely like to do that. Sorry, 20, does the 29th work for people? Yeah. October 29th. Okay, what, what is our start time? And what is our end time? As early as possible. <laughs> um, West, Coast, West Coast people, what's, um, what's the earliest you guys are willing to, to jump in here? 7 o'clock is pretty, pretty early. What time? I mean, 7 o'clock our time, West Coast time, that's pretty early. Seven o'clock, and so what is that? Seven o'clock for those of you in Switzerland and in Belgium. Oh, it's nice. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, can you guys? And how many hours can you guys give? I'm currently free all day, 29th, Thursday, 29th. Okay, so we're going to do Thursday, the 29th. Uh, we're going to start at seven o'clock um, e, um, uh, West Coast uh, American U.S. time, and we're going to go for. Can we do? Can we do five hours? What time is that for us, Charles? It's uh, four, four to nine. nine. Four, four to nine. nine. Four to nine, yeah, we can do that. It's good. Okay. I'm sorry, what day is that? Did you say Thursday or Saturday? Thursday. 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 Okay. Okay. Thursday the 29th. Um, Thursday the 29th. Um, I will, I will uh, take the responsibility of designing the session. I may reach out to some of you guys to help. I know, Jay, you threw some things in there. Um, and Neil, you threw some things in there. So um, uh, we'll, we'll, work, uh, we'll work that. And the goal here is for us to put some shape around um, how we will work together um, and what we need to build and what we need to do and to create room for all the projects, but also to create the infrastructure uh, for these projects to, to begin to make sense in, in context. All right, um, okay. All right, guys, thank you um, and uh, love you all. Be safe and we'll, uh, we'll see you next Thursday. Yeah, thanks everybody. And yeah, I think it's interesting to see the dynamics uh,
you know, swirling and spiraling upwards, let's hope. Uh, and it's how we weave those threads together that's going to create a pattern that's uh, worth looking at. Yep, cool. Take care. All right. Great day, all. Hey, Neil, will you just hang up for a second? Yeah, sure, mate. I've got the bells going in the background, though. <laughs> but oh, okay. We'll see how we go. They'll, if they'll the be bells right. are going, we can, we can find other time um, maybe tomorrow. No, no, this will be good. Stay here. It's all right. All right, I, Peter, I can do hear, you want to throw, you as long as throw it's not the host you. over to us? Or, um, uh, yeah, sure. Neil, can I get your email? Yeah, sure, Judith. Um, let me write it down here for you. Thanks. Matt, you've got a host. All right, thank you. Um, and I guess if people want to hang out, they can hang out. Um, I just wanted to. I just wanted to start to start to while the iron is hot, create a set of a you know creative set of um, like a purpose and objective statement. Um, uh, you know, for this, you know, for this, this thing, and just to get people's, you know, just to get people's comments and, you know, thoughts on where we are at, right? I tried to, I, you know, I purposely tried to, you know, agitate the system there. So, um, and then something happened, um, which I didn't understand um, in that <laughs> process as well. Um, but I think that's just, um, that's just something that, uh, you know, is is good to reconcile right it's good to good to have on the table um so let's let's define a set of objectives um you know for um for the session if you guys will right i think for me some of the things that i've i've heard is you know one one question is you know um what the fuck are we doing here right <laughs> um yeah, sorry for sorry for my French. I've been in Belgium for too long. Um, no, I think that's a great. I think that's a great, um, um, a great thing. Um, are we doing here, right? I think it comes back just to throw in the, the back to last week um, the, the thread on brain, on bootstrapping uh, within the context of OGM was Jerry's way that that he the language for that question. But and I pointed out that that you know that OGM in the context of OGM is, is also not clarified. It's not really defined. So what are we doing here? Where's even here, actually? Yeah, I think, uh, and Charles, I don't know if you were referencing this, but how are we going to fund our time, right? I think that's, you know, that was in there. But um, you, you, you ended with what is even here, right? Um, um, well, I'm being a little bit playful. I mean, I think just to, just to kind of clarify Minim, minimum definition of the container of OGM. You know, what is it that is bringing us together beyond just, you know, Jerry being really cool and, and calling us. But um, I mean, that's a, that, that goes very far, in fact. But, you know. to, to go back to actually, the beginning of this oh, call, Romer had kind of a similar question, right? What What is this thing and how can I fit in? And, you know, what are we trying to do? I think that there is a question about, um, operating model, right? Um, because I think the operating model, right now we only have one, op we have two operating model um, elements. We have a check-in, which um, is going to, it's progressively getting frustrating, I think, for people. Um, um, and we're enduring it because we like hearing what people are working on, but we have a, we have a check-in. And then we have um, a, a kind of a wild west of, um, things like discourse and um, other things where people are pontificating various things, right? Um, but we need to we need to understand what is the operating um, operating model. Is that fair? Yeah, for for me, Matt. I mean, there's there's an information asymmetry that I'm aware of because I don't know what was in what I didn't have time to read. Right, and so. You know, I'm always operating from a position of uh, scarcity of understanding. Same. And so how can I say uh, what it is I think it should be doing unless it comes across in a confrontational way to shake the system and see what happens? And complex adaptive systems adapt by seeing themselves in motion. 
right? And if you can't see all the moving pieces, it's hard to say, well, how do I fit with the other starlings in the flock or where the hell's the shark coming from, you know? And so to, uh, to me, there's a need for the zoom out and the zoom in, but a, but a structure around which to hang that would be really useful rather than leaping to the model for how it should work. Um, I'm just wondering here if, if I can share my screen for a moment and just show the diagram and see if it resonates. If it does, it gives a starting point. If it doesn't, then I'll, I, that's okay, we can do something else. But I've got a PowerPoint diagram here that's possibly worth sharing because it was the thing that yeah, I was I think you can. Thinking. I think you can share. So see if you can share. Okay, let me see if this works. Here we go. Okay. So uh, slide show, current slide, will it let me? Yes. Okay, from current slide. Okay, move you guys over the side there, make you really small. Right, so what I was trying to, and in fact, it's interesting that uh, GCC, the global, uh, what was it, global challenges um, group came up today because this is a diagram that I put to them about two and a half, three years ago now. Um, I've modified it since, but it came from work by Koizumi and others talking about um, brain science and it was multiple disciplines on a base plate, okay, and how they integrated across that base plate. And it showed a transdisciplinary vector of how, um, you know, by weaving these multiple disciplines, they got a higher outcome than they would have done just by having individual discipline silos. So please say anything if I'm going too fast or something you want to clarify, because I've, I've turned vision of, of what you guys are doing, so I can't see the body language off. So. To me, the knowledge commons, for example, peer-to-peer -peer wiki and uh, online global mind are sitting in this spiral with the potential to be woven into shared embodied collective intelligence and content, which potentially creates carefully stewarded knowledge gardens. But the overall intention is that I would believe, and this is again throwing it out there, emergence of better, more efficient, more effective and whole systems engagement and solutions. Right, because we're giving information, we're giving knowledge, we're giving woven information to people at different levels according to where they're coming from. There's multiple sources of content feeding in as the roots. There's a mindful curation process which has to somehow sense why am I bringing this together? And I think this is Jerry's core question. I've been doing this for 20 years, but what am I going to do with it? Right. So there's an understanding of systemic crises and needs over here, and hopefully bringing solutions to the ground in real projects. On the way up, we've got a transdisciplinary synthesis vector, which is doing the weaving. We've got the potential for multiple tools, models and processes. We're trying to uh, create attention and hope and attract resources towards things that are going to be more useful than will otherwise be if they sit in the library all day. Mm -hmm. And so for that, we need networks of networks, of trustworthy systems aware participants, with whole system improvement intent. And Koizumi's work was originally around dynamic and transparent processes of adding new dimensions to multidisciplinary collaboration, fusing and bridging different disciplines to create new fields, innovative processes, tools and models, and collaboration amongst knowledge holders. And I've added a couple in here, but scientists, scholars, action research practitioners, communities and decision makers on behalf of humanity and ecology. And so, when I sowed this seed in front of George Poor, who's doing a lot of work around collective intelligence and education, and Michelle Bounds, Michelle wants me to share it in the peer-to-peer -peer wiki. Uh, I co copied in Michelle and Jerry on, on Facebook. And so we got to a point where uh, this is a recognition that this basic sort of model at least starts to sow some of, some of the stocks and flows and the questions we could be asking. So my question to you is, if this is a useful starting point, could we build questions around who are we doing this for, for what purpose, at what level, and allow the space for people to play at whatever level they, they want to use it and whatever level they want to extract from it. But how do we also support the process? There's other diagrams, which I won't share here because at the moment they're, they've got commercial and confidence players in them. But for example, peer-to-peer -peer commons and peer-to-peer -peer processes have been invited to be partners with a major European project, but who are peer-to-peer -peer in the same way who is OGM, 
Um, and you know, within that context, how do we create a vehicle to take the money that's on offer to bring the value that can be created to ground? What does a legal entity look like that does this, that is actually not just curating the knowledge, but extracting some of the value and putting it back into the commons? And so thanks. how do we apply this? Yeah, yeah. I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Judy, do you want to jump in and then um, we'll go to you, Pete. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't watching the body language. I'll come back to you all. First of all, it's a great graphic, Neil. And I think it almost provides the template for how we could work in the workshop because yes. we could structure breakout groups around different dimensions that you've well defined. Um, I still think very key to this is early testing of outputs in terms of how we would choose to communicate or invite or form working groups or tiny experiments of that nature on um, the bringing it back to real projects, real change. Um, but I love your graphic, so I hope you'll share it with us in OGM and uh, at whatever point it's open to do that. Um, it's really powerful and gives me, I just want to kind of go sit with and think about all the different zones of it and yeah. where I can contribute because I'm not a technology person but I'm a change agent <laughs> and beautiful and that's and I'm not a tech my role person. In the corporation. It's kind of in my role in every group I've ever been in. So and let's so go to, yeah. So let's go to one of our tech people. Sorry to interrupt Judith. Okay. But, uh, Peter, I know you wanted to jump in. Yeah. Uh, thanks Matt. And thank you, Neil. I, I like the diagram very much. Um, I apologize. I have a yes, but comment instead of a yes and comment. And I was going to try saying yes. And, um, but I, I would really just be saying that because uh, pro forma. So, um, so if I had more time or, or something or more attention, maybe I can make it a yes on. But anyway, um, I like it a lot. Uh, I wish the core of it was not knowledge, but sense making. Um, and I wish it wasn't a noun as much as a verb, right? So it's like more like knowing this and wisdoming and um, wising. Um, I also, I think it's kind of implicit in the diagram, but maybe to make it more explicit, I, there's a, the, the knowledge hierarchy of going from data information, knowledge, wisdom, you know, and, and up. Um, I think there's something there to where we're actually trying to, um, trying to evolve a consciousness, uh, and not just capture, you know, what what something is right now. I uh, so that's that. I have one more thought. Also, I the as we talk about OGM as an organization and having a structure and things like that, um, it's my wish or dream or or hope or or whatever that um, when I come to OGM, I think of it. I I try to think of it. Jerry says umbrella is one of the things that he says. And for me, an umbrella contains a federation and not, it's not, so it's not an organization. So um, I know there's a big tension between, you know, structuralistness and structure. Um, I think, I think the whole world needs to be better at being, knowing how to be federated and knowing how to federate, um, wants and desires and needs and you know requests and and asks and gives um and how how that how those exchanges work right so um uh so some part you know some part of the ogm cluster or cloud or federation maybe is something that needs to be making money um but then i wouldn't say that as ogm needs to make money right there's somewhere in the federation collective there are parts that make money and parts that don't and parts that i don't know, give away money and you know parts that whatever um parts that have nothing to do with money or or any kind of you know exchange value it's just all gift economy or whatever yeah so you know pete this is to me i think the heart of the of what we need to do in the session right so neil proposed a model um you know, Judith looked like she said, this is an interesting model to start with. So let's go with this model. Um, I think Pete, you did a nice job of saying, I'm going to actually do a little debate here, the butt side. And you started to propose your own mental model. And I think before we 
say, what are all the work projects that we're going to do and how are we going to execute this model and all this kind of stuff. I think we need to spend some time trying to align on the mental model itself, right? And so what I would propose that we do in this session is we give everybody um, an opportunity to write down on paper their mental model of what this thing is. And then we start to compare those mental models and we start to align those mental models. And I, I think with five hours, we're going to only be able to get some conceptual um, guiding principles or agreements about, uh, about those models and not fully, you know, fully having them rendered. But I think we can, we can get further on that and, and maybe that's the objective. And so Charles and then Judith, because I, uh, I think that was the way that the hand raised and then Neil, and maybe we don't need to call on people here since we're such a small group, but um, you know, Charles, jump in. I just want to go back to the knowledge repository um, and I appreciated that aspect, Neil, of, of what you were sharing there. And I also, like Judy, would like to sit with it and kind of process and kind of split it out in terms of, of the, the process flow and, and the f further sort of practical steps, you know, and, and with, with the, the kind of tangible stuff of like the recordings of our meetings and the transcripts and so forth, like, like this is what we deal with in, in Picolab, as you know, um, and, and, and and very much about the process, the, the, the tasks at hand and the roles involved um, and how we can take on the, the different roles in, in, in just the, the, the basis of, of, of who we are and what we are, which is in the knowledge repository as I see it. Um, in, in real time as an emerging and evolving in terms of the ideas. Um, and then last thing is, is um, I guess, call it ownership for lack of a better word, but you know, how is the, how is literally the, the data and the repository held and, and dealt with and accessed and so forth. I think these are fundamental and will we'll, um, sort of ripple out into all the other areas of governance that, that we want to talk about and, and find out about. I was just going to comment that perhaps in terms of our working session, if we did the homework ahead of time, in contemplating the model and tuning or whatever that you mentioned, Matt, as a starting point, we could come in with this concept to modify slightly in the first portion briefly, and then identify breakout group areas for the different dimensions of it, because some are process, some are content, some are, you know, all the different areas that would need to be framed to actually build the end result and then come back together, um, that would be actually collective creative time. And yeah, you know, just I'll to give you that with this group of people. I'd yeah, have trouble choosing the right breakout group, but that's okay. Yeah, no, just to give you guys a sense of how our process works and, you know, five hours is, um, is actually not, generally not enough time for groups of people to do good design work, right? Um, you know, my ideal state is, a, is it's a usually a three-day process. Um, but um, I don't know if we have the patience or the energy for that. Um, but it does start, usually starts with the individual perspectives, right? And we have everybody um, imagine a future and we give them a set of questions. Right now we're generating those questions and I can create that assignment in advance um, and get it out to everybody. So I think, um, and, and it's an assignment and everybody does their, does their assignment and that's where you start. You start with everybody sharing across the things then you, um, you move from individual perspectives to a small group perspective to um, a large group conversation where you start to align around certain, uh, certain things. And then we usually go into some, um, you know, some multidimensional, call it thinking, right? Where we take, we take the cube of the problem and we break it up. Um, and, you know, we have to identify what those things are. People go work, workshop those problems you know, design challenges, and then we come together. And then usually we, we, we go through this kind of uh, muddling about um, design iteration phase. And we then ask people, we have a synthesis conversation where we align on what are the buckets of work. We break pe people vote with their feet on what bucket that they want to work on. And then they uh, create their own deliverable plan. And then that's, th that's what the action agenda is coming out of the session for people to go to work. And then you begin, you know, keep that process. Now, um, five hours is hard to do that. So um, I think we have to just think, and maybe I can ask you guys that next Thursday we get together 
after our check-in, just like we are today, if people are willing, and I walk through in it a design, you guys push it, then we go and we write that pre-work assignment and we start workshopping this. So um, you just signed up to be the sponsor team. Um, and if, yeah. I can, if, I, if I can just add to that, I love what you've all said. I love, love what Pete said. I uh, loved what uh, Judith said and what Charles said around. Um, and I can weave that into the current diagram. The reason I threw it on the table was that without some sort of common visual, then there isn't a starting point. And so it's not to say mine is the one. It's uh, here's, here's the best map I've been able to create myself. Uh, who else knows part of the territory here that needs to be included? Uh, if you know more about it than me, then I'd have to trust you to put it in there, right? So if we did that and we use next week, and I can get that around to you guys if, if you tell me where to send that to. So what is the best place? Pete, probably the best one to advise on which platform to send what to where, um, I think. Am I right, Pete? So I'm still learning who's who in the zoo and who does what to whom and how. Um, but the, um, to me, if I can, if that diagram provides a starting point, I can modify it, take out some of the references that are ir irrelevant. There's a couple of other things behind that that I've also been playing on that I can put into two or three, four maybe slides, send those to you, see if they're useful. Because I've had to be doing this thinking about how do we, do we have a legal entity to connect with a real project? Um, and does it differ for Belgium, for Holland, for, you know, for America? Switzerland uh, and yeah. Exactly. And so to me, but the generic tool, the generic thing here is there's a knowledge commons, which potentially is woven into a wisdom um, pool, you know, which is then delivered through what to where, for whom, for what purpose, and how do we support the maintenance of the processes which uh, keep that tree of knowledge alive? Right. Yeah, Neil, I mean, I, um, I, I definitely think we should, we can use your model as a basis for developing a set of design questions. Yeah. What I would propose, though, is instead of us starting with a model for this group to react to, that we ask everyone to bring their own model to the, to the meeting. Um, okay. Because I think, I think in doing that, we become much more inclusive um, in, in this process. And that's not to say that once everybody brings their own model, people don't say, okay, this is the best articulation or what can we bring in? But I think if you don't ask people to bring their own mental models in, what we're doing is we're in a state of propose and dispose um, versus co-creation. So um, let's use your, get your model around to this group of people. Um, let's use it as a way to identify a set of design questions, right? Um, but let those design questions be the guide to help other people create their own mental models. And that's where we will start with a sharing of mental models. I think that's the best way to get, get involved in it. Um, but please push back and Judith. This is a yes and. I agree with everything you said, Matt. And clearly we've had some similar life experiences in how to get workshops to be productive. Mine were in corporate and organizational settings, but uh, Same. in any event. Um, we, we kind of have two different goals here, I think, though, because the initial goal of OGM, I believe, was really a good repository that could be used by people so that we were making decisions in context. Um, and the action vector of how that gets used and by whom and at what scale and at what level is very different for all of the purposes. And I think the dimension that's complicating it is the process of the utility of OGM mm. and the groups that would use it and how they would use it. And that's almost a whole separate workshop. But yeah, I don't know I, if that's where people are planning to go, but that's where I was hoping it would ultimately go or that I could easily just extract from it and use it as here's information, here are ways to problem solve, et cetera. Yeah, and Judith, I think, I think that um, your understanding of the kind of the original conversations that Jerry and I were having about OGM um, maybe got moved into really just the knowledge, knowledge management space. But we talked about, you know, again, my frame has always been about how do we better sense what's going on actually? How do we better make sense of that and create no meaning? And then how do we better change make? Um, coming out of that sense making and that we talked about there being service layers on top of the sense making layer on top of the sensing, you know, you know, devices. And so um, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Um, we're, we're all playing at different parts of that, 
of that ecology. Um, and, um, and so I think maybe the other thing that we should really do here is to free people up of what they think this is and move them into a place of what, um, what they imagine it could be in its, full, in its fullness. Because I don't want what we believe Jerry wants to become a, you know, part of the thinking process here, right? Um, and so I, I completely agree with what you're, you know, what you're saying about we have to, we have to make sure that it's the full, that we are, we are asking the question about the fullness of what this thing could be versus just the knowledge side. To of me, it. it comes back to the dendrites we've talked about. Mm -hmm. and you know, I love that word, but there's so much multidimensionality of this. Yes. That I think we don't want to worry about perfecting one piece of it without the experience and experiments of dissemination and use. And so that's a, a process concept rather than a product concept. But Correct. I think the process is what we want to enable um, yes. with the right resources. Lauren, I, I didn't hear what you said. I say yes, 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 yes. Can I, can I say, can I talk? Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, I know I Charles wanted mind. to jump in, but Charles, do you want to oh, defer to Lauren? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll come back after Lauren. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking that um, what I'd like, and I don't, you know, know if anyone else uh, feels this, but um, what's, wh how I think uh, we can, uh, the mission of OGM can, uh, I think we can create the conditions for emergence for that to happen best by increasing a discoverability. We call this discoverability and disambiguation between the you know, groups and people. And that is better defining and sense making who is everyone and what are they actually doing and what are they about. Right now it's really difficult um, cause we all have, we are all working on emerging stuff and we don't really have the vocabulary It's difficult to understand who's good at what and who's working. It's just like so much stuff. So if uh, we can get together, I think a plan of sense making that and better defining that, how do we better define who the people are? Then I think that the, like what OGM is can, can emerge from that. No, yeah, can I just add to like that? Backwards. Yeah, one one of the diagrams that oh, I've been Neil, developing. I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna sorry. break you off, and I'm gonna go to Charles because he's been waiting oh, sorry. patiently. Sorry. Well, okay. Um. Yeah, I'm interested, Neil. Anyway, but yeah, back on back on the the deep profiles and the hash bins. I think it, it points to a lot of the stuff that we're doing. Those are the ways and the forms that we're doing them. Um. But I wanted to actually just float a question over to Pete. Um, in regard to the repository of OGM, because you were one of the keepers um, in, in the sense of, you know, the space makers of, of the discourse in particular, and sort of, I, I, I guess I'm aware, obviously, and much more active in the, in the email forum, Google, Google group. Um, I dip my toe barely into the, the discourse, but I'm aware that that's happening. Um, and then we have um, like the recording um, uh, of the video right now and the transcripts and so forth. All of that is the body of, of, of data and content that is the OGM knowledge repository. I might be leaving out big chunks, but I guess my, if there's a quick um, w way to, to, to say, you know, how it's going, what is it actually? And is it, um, to what, how coherent is it actually? Hmm. A good question. Um, uh, Jerry and I are both trying hard to centralize things into discourse, uh, the discourse forum, um, because it's got uh, kind of the, I, I think of it as bandwidth. It's got a lot of surface area where you can put stuff and it stays there and it's easily findable later and, and uh, things like that. Um, there's a lot of, um, I wouldn't say a lot. Uh, I think all of us have a little bit of frustration with the the forum mechanism um it's you know it's it's got its limitations um but it's better than an email list it's better than slack or irc or mattermost it's better than a media wiki you know so it's it's the least 
bad place. Um, <laughs> so coherence is an interesting, um, uh, interesting question. Uh, you'll see that Jerry spends most of his time uh, on the mailing list, um, and he's had a hard time getting into the rhythm of uh, of the forum. Um, and and it's not because I I, I have that same problem. Um, I can spend a little bit more time on it. Um, so I've gotten a little bit more into uh, discourse, and I, I, I even started to get little surprises. There's little affordances and things like that where uh, somebody was typing, somebody posted an interesting question, and I was writing a reply, and it said somebody else is writing a reply at the same time. There's some really cute little things with discourse, um, and it's full featured and has the places to put things like videos and and you know documents and like links to videos at least uh, transcripts and you know have a long thread of stuff that you can come back to later and find and and make bring a new person in and show them something so discourse is is the place um we're still working on coherence uh you'll see ogm calls get posted by jerry to you know the recording and transcript they get posted the announcement kind of in the link gets posted on the ogm list um, another place where our knowledge repository lives is Jerry's brain. Um, so um, he posts a link into Jerry's brain, and then if I'm good, I'll capture those links and stick them in a thread on the forum. And I haven't been doing that very, very well. Um, but we could do better at that, and maybe even get Jerry to post into the forum uh, mostly instead of into the into the list. Um, uh, I can also tell a little bit uh, that if there's a free Jerry's brain subgroup of OGM, um, uh, the data geeks and and um, you know hypertext experts and things like that. Um, we we actually kind of made a little bit of a breakthrough this week. Um, I created a little thing that is able to navigate uh, any brain, including Jerry's brain, um, through the API. So we're reading data out of uh, out of the brain, and uh, the next step will be kind of remembering it as we read it. Um, so, um, to the extent that OGM is kind of centered around the repository of knowledge that's Jerry's brain, we're starting to break that free, um, which is super exciting, I think. Thanks. Yeah, just just to throw in the the, the other part of my using that word coherence was, was practical. So I think you already responded to that, but you know, how can we use this, access it and, and so forth. So thanks. And I see Neil had his hand up. You'll see also in chat that we had, you know, Neil's like, okay, so, you know, how do I disseminate the, what I've got? Um, so maybe, maybe that's your question, Neil, or? Yeah, that was part of it, but it also comes to Matt's question. How do we better define and understand the participants in the system, the knowledge they can contribute? And to Lauren's point about what are we currently doing? And it's not just what are we currently doing, it's what is it we need to do if we're going to survive? And so the, you know, who do I need to become? And what you just said, Pete, about technical capability and the technical nerds doing the, the beautiful work in the technical competency area, that is uh, around uh, increasing certainty. We know better how to do this, right? There's another axis, so that's certainty and agreement is the other one. How do we get people to agree if they're very, very far out, they're very, very different? And where those two axes of agreement and certainty come together, we can plan because we have order, because we are all agreed and we're all certain. When you get further out, you're into emergence and then into chaos, right? And so when you map then on, on that diagram where people are comfortable, some people are very good high people skills with no technical capability, some people are very high technical with no people skills, the people that can hold the space for all of those skills are critical to hold the container for all of these skills. And so the emergence will come once the system can see itself, both the individuals and the potentials in those individuals. And sometimes the person who currently is best for the job isn't necessarily the person that wants to do that job and may not be the person tomorrow because their calling takes them in a completely different direction. So the question then is, what is the collective calling? And if it's not, how do we start to solve complex, wicked problems you know, in the face of collapse? This is where I've been trying to go with what are we here for, right? But I can't get that level of conversation because most of the people I'm engaging with don't get it, don't want to get it, are in denial or incapable of holding that complexity. And yet if we can, if for those of us to hold that complexity, I believe we have a noble obligation 
noblesse oblige, to hold space for those who can't yet, and to enable them to step into their potentials, to become who they need to become. This is the warrior mindset. If we don't do this, we're fucked. <laughs> right? And so if, if the best job I can do is chop wood, then turn me loose on chopping wood, right? But if you think I'm capable of doing something else, and how do we mutually recognize and mutually assist those who are doing stuff which is so complex or too conscious for most people to recognize the value of, you know, how do we reward those that have been curating the brain for 20 years? At the same time, as how do we reward those that are having to clean the toilets or chop the wood or whatever else it might be in the context of our vision is put a man on the moon or our vision is you know, provide ways through the evolutionary bottleneck for humanity, right? Whatever is the, the overarching purpose. Yeah. So to me, I think there's That's a vision perfect. and some processes. Know, you, yeah. You've you like said that, exactly Judith? what I've been thinking all along because what I'm finding is that I can only pursue this construct with certain percentages and my friends mostly I can have this conversation but a lot of other people that I meet more casually it's way off the deep end of the pool for them yes. and yes. so that that question that that I think we have to look at in addition to your diagram is maybe a whole separate diagram that's not about knowledge curation but process curation and how do we apply the process at every different level in order to sort of maximize the potential for shared learning at all the different levels. Now, yeah. now this becomes a huge process, obviously, but I, d I think that how you would optimize the process for cool laboratory is different than how you would optimize the process for CEOs, et cetera, et cetera. Co um, correct. Yes. And, and, and um, two things, Judith, one is um, when you're chatting now, you're still chatting privately to me versus some of the things that I think oh, sorry. <laughs> put out to the group. Oh, it's okay. Um, the um you know the other thing is scott and i'd love to just jump with you here in just a second but you know your idea of um is it too big for us to have a, a common vision i think um you know to neil's point i mean what am i you know that you everyone's heard the story of when some when kennedy came into nasa and asked the janitor what does he do here he said that you know i'm helping to put a man on the moon right yeah i think everybody when they're chopping the wood or doing whatever has to feel a sense of what they're you know, a sense of what they're doing in the bigger, you know, the bigger picture. That doesn't mean that we all know all of the interworkings and all of the details of, you know, the vision of what we're building, whether it's technically or, you know, you know, those sorts of things. So um, I, I, I really love where this conversation is going. Let me just ask, and I know Scott, you want to jump in here. Where are we right now? I feel like I have enough to, um, you know, enough of these questions and stuff to, um, to go off and, and start to create a little bit of a, an agenda, a process for us for, the, for that time um, and we can get the invitation out. And I think we need to also make sure that we're inviting to that conversation, maybe not just the usual suspects, but, um, or maybe we do, maybe, maybe it's just the kind of the people who show up to these calls needs to, need to be the starting point, but I'd love to get your guys' take on participants. So Scott, and then we can talk about participants. Um, <clears throat> this has been fascinating to listen to. And the thing that I've said from the beginning for me is my attempt to try to take some of this and translate it to a, I, I like to say kids audience. Um, but I think that, that that works in a number of different contexts because these are deep thoughts and you are all deep thinkers. And I think, you know, Judith has, has mentioned it a number of times as well, um, that making this accessible, I think is that that's, a, that's something that I can do. Um, I, I, I can make that, that bridge, but what I wanted to, to bring up, and it's something that I've, I've learned in the last couple of years that kind of shocked me and I've been trying to deal with it. Intelligence is the ability to manipulate concepts and be interested in ideas and and understand things faster and that sort of thing but it's a it's a genetic lottery and we don't want to talk about that it's so far no one has been able to change intelligence to any significant degree and you get what you get and yet we we treat that as a negative and it, it's it's not a negative it's just simply you know, where did you end up on the, on the, the, the skips, you know, and, and the, the example that I heard was that the, 
the U.S. military will not accept anyone below 85 on the, on the IQ scale because they learned that that was not productive for them because they couldn't teach, they couldn't give, they couldn't find them a job to do. And the only reason I say that is that's the bottom like 16% or something like that. And I would say that we all lucked out and are in the top 16%. And it's easy to forget that most people are not, don't have that ability. They might be stronger. They might be better to organize groups. They might be more empathetic. They might be handsomer. They might, be, you know, they have all their own genetic lottery winnings. But, but that I've been trying to say, well, this is something that I was, I, I got a good roll of dice. That's all I got. And so what can I do to, to use that in a way that benefits people and it, and it, it felt like a, a translation like like how can i how can i help take some of these things that i can understand and translate them so that more people can understand and make them them useful for themselves and that that was the only thing i wanted to, to say is that i i see all of the great work that we're doing and that that I feel like one of the roles or the role that, that I'm trying to help play is to take that and feed it off to people who, like, like I think Matt, you were saying, you were holding up that book and saying, you're a really smart guy and this book is really hard to understand. And you know that there's, there's great things inside of it, but, but you know, even you are struggling with that. And how do we get these useful things out to people? Um, yeah, so anyway, it's, that, it's, that's it's, just kind of the concept that I had. So I'll, I, I'm, I'm done. And, and I hear what you're saying, Scott. I worry, you know, part of the reason why I'm able to understand this book is not just my intelligence. It's the fact that I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm white, I'm male. Um, it's because, you know, my, my parents were too busy to raise me. So they sent me to some weird private school on the hill with a bunch of hippies who taught me how to think. So I think we have to be also be careful about, um, you know, the, the inherent privileges that come with having people who teach us how to think and, and, and teaching people how to think is something that we, you know, is, you know, is part of this. And so um, I want to, I understand, and maybe there are genetic differences, but I just want to be very, That's very a better careful. way of saying what I was saying. Yeah. I agree with that inclusiveness. I think I do believe in teaching people thinking. And so, yeah. so I, I, yes, I agree with what you're saying and that it still goes to how do we, or how do I use my thinking skills that I've been blessed with to be able to help other people find the path that they might not even know exists. Um, Pete, just the book is um, down, down to Earth um, by uh, Bruno Latour and Doug has been pushing it and it's, um, it really is a reframing book. And I know Charles, you wanted to jump in, but I see your hand is down and other people's are up, but who wants to go next? Well, Neil seems more uh, eager, but I, I, I'd want to say something too. You go first, Charles. Um, well, just pretty briefly, I, um, back on, uh, let's see now, do I actually have the thread? It, it was, it's about the, back on actually Matt, what you said much earlier in the main call about Kiko Lab, um, and how you don't really understand, and, and you know you're not alone. And I think we did we did improve a lot in, um, in terms of the languaging on our website and in another um, profile that we put together at the Alliance for a Conscious Internet. Um, but um, so we're we're refining our language. But I think um, the way I tend to I've, 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 I consistently see it as in the, through the process of refining as um, just down to the 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 essential components, the elements of um, what Lauren um, and I call the wisdom stack, sort of uh, workflow, collective intelligence workflow with, with, it's essentially really low tech. It's basically all duct taping. And um, um, it, it doesn't have to stay in duct taping mode, but we can get really far with like very rudimentary tools, but they have to work together, play together, dance together. And that's on the human side. It's not like the tools are not 
really built for that for the most part, you know, this interoperability. So I'm saying a bunch of things, but back to, you know, the interoperability is core. The components each are core in, in, in how they're put together in a, in a very particular processes, flows, sequences, iterations, and, and, and you know, phases of, of, of going through these kind of clusters of, of workflows. And, 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 and there is complexity. It, it, it just is. And, you know, you can dumb it down in terms of, like, how you explain each part. It ends up being, like, a quite lengthy laundry list. And so it's been really hard to kind of avoid the laundry listing and the, the using fancy words. We can kind of use simpler words, but there's still a lot of parts to explain and how they all fit together. Uh, I don't know. If, yeah. Beat. And I don't know if it's about simpler words or less simple words, right? I, I, um, I'm a trained artist. That's what I went to school for. I went to graduate school and I ended up leaving the art world because I felt it was um, in some ways um, highly masturbatory, right? The conversations between um, you know, myself and my teachers and stuff were very, very much related toward very inwardly focused and about sort of the kind of the pleasure of being on the inside group and referencing other people and those sorts of things. And you've built up a pattern language over time that um, language are, you know, it is the, is the, is the core mental models you know, that we use as human beings. It's the very beginning and it's the, in, in some ways, it's some of the hardest things to, to change. And so over time, working in all these groups, you've built pattern languages, right? You use the word flow and processes and um, things like that in different ways than I use those words. And so that's where the confusion comes in is I think it's in, it's in, la it's in the pattern language. And so, you know, do we take time to actually codify the language that we use so that's, that we yes, can all yeah. use it and, and versus just using it and hoping other people can kind of intuit what it means. It right? takes time to make it, to make that coherent. Yeah, yeah. we need, we need a, we need a, we need a dictionary and, and, and a lexicon and, and part of what well, makes this book hard is he introduces a word like modernist at the beginning and he defines it and then he uses it, you know, later on expecting you to really remember it. So you have to work, you have to work the language as much the, as anything. The, so, the Judith. Phrase, sorry, wait. Just, you wait till you get going, to metamodern, then yeah, you're screwed. Yeah. One more <laughs> phrase, which is, which is, um, and, 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 and Pete has, has gone a little further with, with us on this, is the, the idea of the minimum viable ontology. Ah, okay. right. Go ahead, Judy. <laughs> well, I just want to come back to some wisdom that I saw recently when I was scouting out self learning modules for folks that could be used for homeschooling and stuff. And the American Chemical Society, and I forwarded this to our snarky group, but not to the whole GM, OGM list, is going with age appropriate, which in a sense can be translated in easily to capacity related ability for intake of learning. Um, if we can go to more graphic and artistic approaches of showing how things work and invite people into understanding change as a process, the steps of change, the, the new seed that grows something and changes the garden, whatever we want to do that's kind of metaphorical, but art and visual is a very powerful way to invite change in universal levels. And that's a whole different dimension that could be explored as we look at not just talking to ourselves in the intellectually elite of the world, now, a lot of those people are in positions of influence, so that doesn't mean we shouldn't communicate with them, too, in an appropriate way to reach that particular group of individuals and biases. And I mean that positively and negatively on bias. And I think I've probably said enough. I'm kind of rambling here. If I can just pick up on a couple of things that have been said. Um, Scott, I hear what you're saying. I don't see it as elitist. I see it as using our privilege for good. Um, Secondly, we've had part of this conversation before around indigenous wisdom and indigenous knowledges and indigenous language and their pattern languages were related to the earth on which they walked, mm -hmm. right? And which they stewarded. And so the deep indigenous wisdom is the step beyond just wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge in systems context. Correct. Indigenous wisdom is the application of knowledge in systems context with deep time forward and backwards thrown in right? on, Seven the, generations. On, the, on the terrestrial body exactly in the terrestrial exactly body. and the beauty of this coming back to scott's point is that the stories told around the campfire were told in the same language 
relevant to the current present day, i.e. what we've walked through, what we're going to go through tomorrow, where the seasons are at, what's happening now, that could be told by any one of the speakers who, who was given the task for that night, but they had to make sense to everybody from the equivalent of the theologians to the kindergarten kids. But the deep wisdom was inherent in the story. The education process was based on asking the next question, not having the next answer. And so when the student asked the next question, they got referred to the next level of knowledge custodian. Don't talk to me, I'm an intern, talk to the professor, right? Don't talk to the professor, talk to the, talk to the dean, whatever else the, the structural hierarchy might be. But the wisdom hierarchy was in the knowledge curation and the knowledge holder and the respect for those was because the story was being told true to cause, true to common oral understanding in a language that made sense in current systems context. And if we can't do that with the OGM, I'll be very surprised. Provided we share the same understanding of systems context, right? Otherwise we're wasting our time creating another business model for somebody who's not gonna be here in 10 years time because of sea level rise, right? So, you know, how do we actually create models that work for the future? Unless we show what's changed in the past, use language that makes sense, and bring people on the journey, regardless of what level of development they're at, understanding they're at, and doing that, and this is where metamodern comes into it, unlocking the potentials hidden in each of you, each of us. It's not just the intelligence, what other sorts of intelligences. The guild model that I've heard mentioned a couple of times, if I'm correct in my assumption, it means that there's at least some sort of hierarchical recognition that although I'm a silversmith, I'm a day one silversmith, not fourth generation silversmith with mm -hmm. 60 years of experience. And so it's recognizing and respectful of the elders who are holding a different level of knowledge custodianship within a common system of knowledge, within a common language, in a common systems context. So wanna, wanna just real quick, and I wanna just play process facilitator here for a second. Um, you know, always with my sponsors when we're doing a sponsor conversation, and this is what this feels like in terms of designing the, you know, a session. Um, you start to get in the place where you start doing the work of the of the session, um, and that's usually an indication that you're on the right hunt, but also that um, you're sort of ready to call the, you know, call the sponsor conversation complete, and and decide whether or not you want to spend more time, you know, doing some solutioning to understand what's going on or, or to call it. So I think that's where we're at. And if we wanna continue this conversation, that's, you know, that's fine. I know it's, um, it's 12.30 East Coast time. I know it's late for some people um, and early for, or you know, different things, but um, where, are we get, where are we at before we continue? I'm hungry and I'm gonna go soon. Okay, <laughs> so why don't, here. yeah, no, but like, why don't we, why don't we call it? Um, why don't we make the next step here um, which is I'll put together a design document, a process document, something that we can outline for, um, you know, next week. Um, you know, I think there's a couple of different component pieces that go into any one of these sessions. You need the right process, but you also need the right participants. Um, can everyone think about who's the right group of participants, right? I think um, on Zoom, you know, we could probably handle a group of maybe 21 um, maybe, um, uh, you know, that's probably a good, you know, a good thing. We tend to break out into teams of, um, you know, five, so maybe 20, and we get four groups of people. The more people you have, just the more time you need because you're, you know, diverging and converging and stuff, um, and everybody needs the chance to speak. So um, I think we should really think about what are the vantage points we want and who do we, in, you know, who do we invite? What about, um, what about just doing a, like a survey or a couple of quick, quickish surveys, like to get the questions out there and to get us already like putting our responses together in advance. Like, like, yeah, just I, I think the whole thing, it's still pretty abstract for me. Like we know who we want to work with or who we like to hang out with and, and interact with and who's very creative and productive in sessions. But, but you know, what, what's the, the point of focus? Yeah, so that's what I want to talk about next week. After, you know, let's say after the call, check in next week, um, I'll, per, I'll put out there the design document, which will have sort of the purpose objectives of the session, as well as the flow of the session, as well as what we think the pre-work, you know, the pre-work is. And then um, if we agree to the, that pre-work, that's when we will, 
we would send it out. But I want to know who we're sending it out, you know, kind of who we're sending it out to. You know, my general recommendation is there's been people who have attended these Thursday morning check-ins, um, and that's who we would send it out to. I do wonder about our diversity um, and if we're going to be designing something. But I, I don't want to bring new people necessarily in um, who are participants, but there are some people on discourse who participate all the time that never come on our Thursday check-in calls. So um, I just think we should just think about if, if the general purpose is to define what the fuck are we doing here, right? And what is this thing and how do we organize this thing um, so that we start to, start to move from just discourse to you know, aligned momentum around things. Um, you know, who would you want to bring? And let's, let's get one more week cycle. And then Charles, I think we come to that, you know, we come back to that question about getting some things out to people. I, um, I, I just wanted to, because I, um, just to quickly comment, um, Scott, I'm really resonating with, with this role that you are called to perform in regard to translation. And I would, you know, I think we, we want to, Lauren and I want to come uh, together and, and connect more with you anyway, but I think maybe that is a great place for all of us to start, but, but at least um, we can energize that, uh, that conversation for sure. Just, just a very quick anecdotal comment. I remember in my early church going experience that they would bring the kids up to the front and there was, you know, the lesson was for the kids, but it was not told, it was told to the kids, but the whole congregation is listening. And it was, the lesson had to be digestible for the little ones, but it also resonated at a higher level because everyone brought their own context into that. And so I, I think that if I can't teach a kid what we're doing, then I don't, I don't understand what we're doing. And, and maybe that's the way that I try to, to frame it for myself. And I think, you know, we have these great conversations, but, but that's sort of the litmus test for me. I had a quick exchange, I just very quickly, really on this point, um, with, with um, a, a Turkish guy that, that, um, that I know, a musician who's also organizing stuff. Um, and I sent him uh, stuff about Kiko Lab, and 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 then we we found we found that we we had this point of commonality around the kids um, learning stuff, and but then he said right away, and this was all in a Telegram chat, um, but but uh, you know how are kids going? You're doing stuff for kids. How are kids going to understand this? And then I found I could look it up. It was kind of I I put it better then than I'm going to do right now, but. You know that's a that's a heavy load to put on a on a kid on especially little kids to have you know to be able to understand a lot of this stuff and in in terms of having you know and and there was sort of the idea of leadership in this conversation and you know to kind of expect or ask or even hope you know in some ways for kids to lead that's just, just a big question yes they do and they're smarter than we are in so many ways and more creative and a whole bunch of things um i but 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 we 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 are responsible. Oh, hey, Jerry's back. Um, in in certain ways that that we don't, you know, kids kids need and deserve their childhood. Sorry, I think you get the point. Let me say this in a, in a in a simplified way that that I'll just encapsulate this way. So my introduction to systems thinking was in April. I'm 54 years old, and that was the first time I'd ever heard of it, and. I found it through the Cabrera Research Lab, which is one group of people who are doing work on that. And they've, they've honed it down to DSRP, distinctions, systems, parts and wholes, relationships, and perspectives. And they teach these. They say those are the Lego blocks of all thinking. And there are videos of them and working in schools with First graders, teaching them how to make distinctions between this and that, how to divide things into parts and wholes, how to connect and see relationships and how to view them from different perspectives. And it wasn't that the subject matter that they were dealing with was super heavy. What it was is they were teaching them how to think at the same time as they were teaching them whatever the subject was. And so then they could use the how to think tools with the next subject and the next and the next. And that was what I was thinking of. And I think 
Neil, you had started talking about the difference between kind of what we're doing and how we do it. And the, the process, and Judith, I think you agreed with that, having the process curation in addition to the actual knowledge curation. And this felt to me with the kids, it was the process that was so important to teach them how to have a dialogue, how to think, how to be open, how to look at something and say, what do I think about this? And, and that's kind of the way I thought about it, not introducing the kids to topics that they can't handle because it's just, it's too, it's too much. Just to pick up. Firstly, uh, Scott, yeah, I muted, <laughs> I said I'm muting. Um, firstly, I agree with the, kindergarten, with the uh, Sunday school story, right? But that's a known story with multiple levels of meaning, depending on the learning and the complexity and the capacity of the adults to hold something greater than what the kids get. I'm not diminishing the, the potentials in kids, but kids, kids aren't going to save the planet. Kids are going to inherit the planet that we leave them. And when I did my work in the United Nations Regional Centre of Expertise for Education and Sustainability in Australia, trying to get this started, it's the parents that are preventing the kids from doing what they're learning and what they already have the capacity to do. And so we have to change the current paradigm thinking, current neoliberal, current economy, current measures, current GDP, current structures, current inequalities, in that's not the kids holding that, right? We can't at this point wait for the kids to get there because time is so short. And so the, the point I think uh, people might agree with here, and this is what we were saying, Matt was saying, if we include more people, it gets harder because we've got to bring them up to speed, right? Why? Because there's an information asymmetry. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we don't know who they are. Why? Because we don't know if they're capable or mature enough. You don't turn a three-year-old loose with the keys to the car, right? So while we don't, might don't? Not like, while we might not like the idea of having some sort of structural, functional hierarchy here, we need to say who is capable of traveling further, faster now? And how do we transcend to then include? And I haven't seen Jerry's talk yet, but that's on trust. Who do we enable to go further faster on behalf of all of us and who will come back for us? So it's not we're leaving them behind and we're not including them. It's to transcend to then include, not wait until we're all included to try and transcend. Because that's the developmental journey which has been broken by the atomized model we live in today, right? And, and our democracy is broken by this incapacity to hold the plurality and the different levels of capability and maturity and the fake news and all the other bullshit that goes on around it in the context of what is coherently real with the cosmos and what is coherently real what earth needs and what is coherently real what my capability is and if we can get the vertical literacy the vertical alignment so that we can tell simple stories to kids in sunday school and have it make sense to the adults because it is true to what earth needs then we're getting there but we're at a critical point where we are the ones currently tasked with trying to turn this into something that's usable. That's a different task to how do we currently use the stocks and flows and the capability and maturity in this group. And it's not elitism, it's functional hierarchy, right? And nature doesn't do everything with everything. You know, fungi do something different to trees, do something different, but they mutually respect because they all contribute to a rich ecology. And so, you know, with respect, I can see the need for that, but I think there's a separate step, which is how do we create the stocks and flows to move? Yeah. Just feeling about really um, challenged and conflicted around around uh, media and internet and, and how our kids are exposed to it, you know, by varying degrees, generally just way too much um, into, of, of certain types of content. Um, and information, you know, that, that's related to what we're talking about, I think, in terms of, you know, big kid stuff, you know, grown up stuff, that stuff that's supposed to be for grown ups who actually act like grown ups. Uh, and it's, it's tough. I, I mean, it's really tough. Um, you, you know, sort of the, 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 the tech gurus um, don't let their kids on, on the stuff at all. And it tells you a lot. I think, um, it's not realistic to completely shut them out, speaking from my own experience anyway. It, some people do that successfully and, or try and, and fail. Um, but how to kind of um, to ratchet, filter, um, mediate, 
the, the media um, and, and allow, you know, give the kids, let, the, let them have their childhood however they can, as much as they can, because that is so precious and fleeting. Yeah, again, I just want to, I want to note that we're, we're in the design conversation now. Um, and, um, and I know, Jerry, you just, you just came back. We're, we're talking about um, October 29th. Is that right? Um, so October 29th, we're going to do um, 7 a.m. Um, uh, Pacific time. Um, we're going to do a five-hour session. I'm going to, at least that's what we're, pr we're proposing right now. I'm going to work up an agenda. Um, I need to get a, you know, this chat transcript um, to me because there's a lot of the questions in here. Um, uh, I'm going to work up an agenda. We're going to, part of that agenda is going to include a pre-work assignment, uh, an individual perspectives assignment where everyone's going to bring something to the meeting um, and um, uh, their own mental models. And then, and then we'll go from there. We're going to review that agenda, the objectives, the um, kind of the scope, the guiding principles and all that kind of stuff and the process next week. Um, so I'll produce that agenda for next week um, for, and then the sponsor team is going to get together at that time, right after, right after our Thursday call to review that stuff. And then we will get, um, you know, we'll get everything out. Um, I think we're, we're, one of the questions is, is who, who's going to, who's going to be invited to this thing? Um, and who's going to be that initial kind of core group of people to do some of the definition work. And then out of the, out of that um, process, we will have uh, bodies of work, activities, things of that nature, other people we might want to engage. Um, I didn't think you were going to invite Jerry, uh, Matt. That's wor really worrying now. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, one, one, more quick, one more quick point. I'm going to have to go shortly. I'm supposed to be cooking dinner about two hours ago. Um, yeah, dinner and Jerry, bathrooms Jerry, and food I and all that stuff, right? Yeah, just letting Jerry know, Jerry, I, I, I shared my screen with the diagram that I shared online to you and, and others uh, recently on, on Facebook as a bit of a nucleus to build some questions around. Judith and I are going to have a conversation about a couple of my diagrams and what might be useful to the group. And we'll bring those back in to feed into this process that Matt's doing with the design for next week. Um, so is that the way everybody else understands it? Yeah, at the moment? Yep. So yeah. we're looking for more kind of specific design questions and we're looking for just nailing our participant list. Um, yes. and I'll work the, I'll work the process and we have the place and, and time, um, uh, determined. So my calendar tells me that October 29th is a Thursday and 7am is when our normal check-in would happen. So my assumption was that this would replace the check-in call and anybody would be invited who wanted to attend, but it doesn't sound like that. No, I think that that's, I think one of the things that I, I want is it's, um, yes, anybody who wants to attend, I think that's true, but I think people need to, um, you know, they need to let us know because we're going to be designing breakout groups and, and, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and, um, and the question is, do we want to invite some people that, um, uh, that, have attended, but maybe haven't attended in a while, or do we like, how do we want to make sure that we, you know, bring people there? And I'm, I'm open to being open. I just, I think that these processes break down if it's, if it's too loose on, on some of these things. So it should be kind of an RSVP and I, I think also so. specifically ask people who might not otherwise show up. Correct. And I want, and I want people to commit to the full five hours. Right, and, and it's not like you come in at the middle of the process and you leave in the middle of the process and come back. I mean, it's really, these things don't work if you're trying to catch people up or, right, they just, you gotta get the whole group into the same design mind and moving forward if you want. So we can, we can phrase this as a workshop and we Correct. can make it RSVP and we can say there will be pre-work and we can say, expect, yep. you know, please don't commit unless you can be there the whole time. And we can invite people who are normally routinely part of these calls. That all sounds great to me. Judy, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think that's an important dimension of how you manage it because otherwise it gets kind of crazy if people come in to the workshop and haven't been involved in the discussions or the pre-work in an effective way. Right. It just becomes dilutive in terms of playing catch-up. Yep. I don't mean to sound elitist because I really am inclusive. And I think yeah, most so of the people who've been in these calls are pretty great thinkers. But it might yeah. it might explode in size. There's a risk of that because the OGM group is pretty big, and I think all of the people who read the streams are probably pretty interested 
and where to go with this? I think, I think saying that it's RSVP, giving it a different link from our usual link, uh, et cetera, et cetera, will manage the crowd size really easily. Like, like you got to commit to the time and it's RSVP and it's not the, you, they can't click on the old calendar link. I think that'll be fine. And, and anybody else um, will meet next week. You know, this, this is replacing this week's check-in call. So. Good question for you, Jerry, because I think just before you came back, um, it came up, I think Matt made the point that, you know, sort of questioning, what about the diversity? Is there something, what about the diversity? <laughs> I, when, I, when, I, when I started sending invites out, I was trying to challenge every sort of person who is not diverse to invite other people who are, who are in fact diverse to the meeting. <clears throat> that has worked not well. Um, Same for us and, to keep it up. And I, mean, I would just ask that we do that more, that we bring that up, that we, uh, that we do that for the invite to, for the workshop, et cetera. But, but I, I'm at wit's end for how to make it happen more. Uh, there's 50 different sort of carts I wanna be pushing forward. And I can't, I've, I've discovered uh, too late in life that it's really hard to push 50 carts forward. So yep. um, one, of them is, one of them is making sure that these meetings are far more inclusive. Yeah, and maybe we, we have to just accept what we what we have and then make that part of, you know, the question set, right, that we're wrestling with and, and figuring it out, right? Um, and I think Scott's question of how do we measure diversity is, a, is, a, in, is an interesting question. Uh, Scott, to me, to, me, to me, it's like um, anybody who's not a white male uh, adds, adds to our diversity. Well, like anybody who's not in my I, demographic. Sure. Cult, the only culture, reason that I say that is... Yeah, is I've been challenged recently to think about that in a different way and say, well, does that mean that every white male thinks the same? And, and I think we can say there, there is the potential for incredible diversity within physical attributes or demographic attributes. And, and that, but again, this is not a fully formed thought. It's just the idea that what we know of each other are largely visual. And, and we're making judgment calls based on that. And I agree that having increased visual diversity can lead to other forms of diversity. But and and there's, a, there's a person who's in the OGM list but hasn't shown up for any of the calls, who is on the autism spectrum, who friended me on Twitter, who is phenomenal, who's done really, really interesting things, who will probably never show up to any of our live calls because he or she basically said, I don't handle live really well. And I'm thrilled that they're in our conversation um, and would love to know sort of how to do that more. And also our check-in mode of going through every square and every person checks in is a lot of pressure on people who don't like that kind of process. So that sort of decreases the diversity of introverts or people who just want to lurk and jump in when it's appropriate. So I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of those things. I just haven't, haven't figured out how to solve them all. Uh, Neil, Neil, you need to go feed your family. Yes, I think we all. I think we all have to go. This was really, really um, productive. I'm glad we got the extra bonus time. I feel like there's more shape to um, the future just from this. So thank you, guys. Uh, Pete, thank you so much for pinging me and saying you were still on the call. And yeah. forgive me, guys, for my for my thumb. And when I, earlier, when I put my thumb up and realized it was there, I stuck my finger up and realized that was the wrong <laughs> finger. So if that comes through in the recording, it wasn't intended. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Thanks, everybody. Save the chat for yourself. Yeah. How do I save the chat? Oh, do I just? So the chat I... will automatically save with the recording because you didn't turn off the recording in between, or you did? No. Might be good if he has a copy though. Uh, but I go if... if I go save chat. Yes, that'll yeah. work. Save chat. And where we'll does it go? It goes uh, into your documents folder. Yeah. It shows okay. you documents or downloads. Here. Is it documents or downloads? Documents. Documents. I think it's documents. Zoom, Zoom, and then... then you can just. Click oh, that's right. It goes into your documents. Uh, there's a Zoom, there's an applications, there's a Zoom folder right, under that, I think. Take care, everybody. See you. Oh, Thank you. All right. Thanks, Pete. That was a great tip. Bye, guys. Rockin'. Peace. Be well. Bye, we'll see you next time. I'll be in touch, Judith. <laughs>